board for an advisory opinion. Um, so given the proposal, staff questioned if the building addition will warrant an expansion of the current parking area on the site. Uh, so the applicant should be sure to discuss this with the board. And staff has provided the board with a host of review comments, uh, many of which could be addressed during a formal site plan uh, review process uh, in the future. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jim. Applicant, please introduce yourself and the uh, project. Yeah, hi, evening. Uh, Andy Morrill from DH2M. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, also with me this evening are uh, representatives from the owners of the of state manufactured homes, uh, as well as the building architect. So if there's questions for them, we'll certainly uh, bring them up. Uh, Jamel did a good job going through his kind of breakdown of the project there. Um, this community center was originally approved uh, back in 1990, around that time. Uh, it's therefore a grandfathered use, non-conforming use. Uh, a community center is, is not a permitted use in the industrial uh, district. Um, hence, we're here this evening looking for a miscellaneous appeal for a non-conforming use. Um, as Jamel said, we were here back in 2018. At the time, we were proposing a roughly 5,500 square foot increase to the building. Uh, the applicants <clears throat> self sent that out to bid, found that the, the costs for that uh, building improvements were, were very high. Um, hence, they've kind of reworked things and scaled down the scope and size of the project. Uh, what they're hoping to do is a, a 3,000, a little over 3,000 square foot uh, expansion of the community center. Uh, that is shown in the plan that's up on the overhead there. Um, items that have changed, well, I guess the first question the board is probably going to ask is why an expansion? The uh, existing community center was, was built around 1992. When it was built, the uh, Hillcrest community had approximately 165 units. There are currently 335 units that have been approved out on the in the Hillcrest community. So the existing community center is is undersized for for what they're trying to do with this facility. Um, we did receive uh, a lot of Jamel's comments, and I'd like to kind of touch on a few of those briefly, if I if I could, hoping to give the board some direction before we jump into this. Um, again, keep in mind what we're looking to do here is very similar to what we did in 2018. Um, parking, uh, many of the uh, events that are held at this facility are community events from the Hillcrest community. Most of the people walk. Uh, the state manufactured homes also provides a bus service uh, to these events, uh, so the need for people to drive to these events is very small. <coughs> there is some existing parking on the facility. The parking that's there is, is more than adequate to accommodate what's at the community center now and what would be uh, in the future. Um, what, there were some questions on the wetland delineation. The wetland delineation as shown on the current plans was done by Albert Frick Associates in 2016. Uh, stormwater for the facility um, the applicants are going to propo uh, propose a roof line drip edge filter around the exterior of the proposed building expansion, which will treat the runoff and uh, discharge it to the abutting wetlands. Again, a lot of these details will be worked through when we come back for the site plan approval, but I just wanted to give the board the information now. Um, the applicants in, in my office will certainly work with the town and Portland Water District on, on um, the permitting of, of the project for the for the utilities. Um, the last item I want to touch on was sprink, uh, the sprinkler system. There was a comment in there about the building needing sprinklers. It's my understanding the, the size of the building expansion uh, is, is well below the threshold to require a, sprinkles, a sprinkled system. Uh, the building architect is here. He can certainly touch on that if, if that's something the board would like him to. Uh, the applicants look forward to working for, with the town, and, and we're hopeful we could get a positive advisory opinion this evening from the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, we have opportunity tonight for public comment. And I'll just as a general statement, if you're here for public comment, please keep it to less than five minutes this evening. There is uh, quite a hefty agenda in front of us, and a lot of people probably willing to speak. So, anyone on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, just for planning board purposes, I mean, this is just an advisory opinion. There's no motion or approval that's needed right now. Um, and since that this board had reviewed this uh, last year, 
Um, I'm just going to kind of open it up to anyone that might have some questions um, in general because we did spend quite a bit of time on the proposal the first time we saw it, and this is just a smaller building. So, yep. any any questions from this board regarding this project? Um, I just said one. He did a good. He did a good job last time. So I don't have a lot of questions. I was just wondering: Are you is the um, existing community center going to stay open during the whole renovation period, and you're just going to kind of that's that's the goal is they'd like to keep it open and, and usable during the construction. I think there's yeah. quite a bit of improvements that are going to go into the existing existing facility. Okay. Um, that's fine. I'm, the I'm the sure entire you're... floor plan of, of the existing facility is being altered um, as part of it. So, okay. okay. The building architect could probably touch on that if that's some, if you wanted more detail on that. No, I was just curious. I was wondering. I'm sure you got to figure it out. So. Yes. Yeah. Certainly something we'll figure out as we move forward. Yeah. Have anything else from the plan? I, I'm just curious what the size, and I may have missed it, but I don't think I saw the size of the current facility. The current facility, I believe, is about 40 by 60. Or, sorry, square footage. Square foot. So it's about 2,400 square feet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. The expansion is a little over 3,000, I think. Yes. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Right. Seeing, a, uh, seeing a lot of heads nodding, so uh, we're going to send a positive, uh, positive review over, uh, an advisory opinion, I suppose. We'll go and make sure that we show that we were relatively satisfied with what we seen. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Next item, Crossroad Holdings, LLC, request a preliminary subdivision review as part of the planned development project for the Downs, Innovation District, Innovation Park, and the Payne Road Commercial Gateway, 90 Payne Road, Assessor's Map RO52, Lot 4. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you guys know, uh, this project is located in the Crossroads Planned Development District uh, along the northerly portion of the Downs property with access off of Payne Road. Uh, so in December, the board granted a uh, master plan approval for phase two of the redevelopment of Scarborough Downs. Uh, the master plan set the parameters for the development of the subdivision uh, before you this evening. The applicants in front of the board tonight with a preliminary subdivision plan for the entire phase two site. That includes a 57 lot subdivision within a portion of the property consisting of 66 acres. The remaining land uh, includes two stormwater basins, 30 acres of wetlands, and 40 acres of open space. As the board may recall, during master plan review, uh, the board requested that the applicant provide several areas for placemaking throughout the plan development. The applicant has provided several renderings of these proposed areas. Uh, I should be sure to discuss these areas with the board tonight. Staff has provided a host of comments in regards to the, the proposed road design for the public streets in the project. Uh, so the applicant should be sure to uh, touch on these comments with the board tonight as well. Uh, continuing on, staff did raise some questions about the proposed connectivity between phase one and phase two on the Downs property. Um, so the board and the applicant should be sure to discuss uh, the plans for that connectivity. Uh, staff would like to note that the applicant's currently working with Maine DOT on their traffic movement permit and hope to schedule a scoping meeting for the project in the next few weeks. Uh, the board will be seeing a detailed traffic impact study uh, with future submissions. Staff did raise some concerns about the proposed trailhead parking along Innovation Drive, the primary concern being the safety of the pedestrians who will be using the proposed on-street parking spaces and crossing the road to access the proposed trails. The board should provide direction to the applicant and staff on whether you would prefer parking to be located on-street as proposed or off-street or at an off-street trailhead parking area. And finally, the standards in the zoning ordinance seek to limit direct vehicular access off of Payne Road. Uh, so the applicant should discuss the proposed access to lots 1A and 1B with the board given the location of these lots along Payne Road. And staff has provided a host of other review comments uh, for the board to consider, but at this point, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Jamal. Rocky? Good evening. Uh, Rocky Risbarrow III uh, with Crossroads Holdings, LLC. 
Um, really excited to be back uh, in front of the planning board tonight uh, with Innovation Park. Uh, as Jamel said, we were last in front of you in December. Uh, so some of you folks are going to be familiar with this. I see some new faces on the board um, and uh, welcome you uh, to the planning board. Buckle in. Um, Scarborough Downs is going to take some planning board uh, time, but uh, we really uh, we've got a big project here and look forward to working together. Um, as I said, so we were here last year in, in December um, and got a master plan approved. <coughs> We've worked uh, diligently since then, and hopefully you've enjoyed the break from, from hearing from us uh, since then. Um, Dan and uh, his team at Grohl Palmer have done uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, a lot of engineering work has been done, and uh, we think we've uh, moved this plan along uh, pretty well and are, are hoping to leave here tonight with a preliminary approval um, we realize there are a lot of loose ends that are going to need to get cleaned up, uh, and we're in a lot of a lot of balls in motion uh, in that regard right now. But um, we've got some end users that we're working with right now. We've got about 18 uh, end users on the list that are all very interested in our in our project, and are very real. So we're uh, anxious to be able to send a message that we're moving through the process with this, and that and that it will uh, you know, it will be real uh, and be available for them this summer. Uh, Dan has a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation for you tonight. It's going to take a little bit of time. I ask you to bear with us. Uh, we do have a lot of ground to cover, uh, but we've got a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information to pass on to the board tonight. And uh, I guess I'll turn it over to Dan to have him get going. Um, I think we've got a handful of slides to see. Our engineers are here as well to answer technical questions. And uh, at this point, I guess I'll turn it over to Dan. Dan, while you set up, I'm going to take a quick moment for a little housekeeping. Um, item number nine, I believe, on tonight's agenda, cottages at Sawyer. Um, that has been tabled, so if you were here by any chance for that, you do not have to be any longer. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon, I got a frog in my throat tonight, so uh, <coughs> bear with me with the, the presentation. Um, and I'll, I'll do my best, and I guess maybe it'll help me keep it as brief as possible. Uh, Rocky did a great introduction, um, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, as he indicated, we have a lot of slides and a lot of different elements to cover with the project, so I'm going to fly at a fairly high level, um, but as questions come up, feel free to inter interrupt me um, or, or write them down, and during uh, discussion and comments, either I can respond or our engineers. So um, I'm going to dive right in. For the board members who have been on for a while, you know exactly where uh, the Innovation Park is in phase two. Uh, for, for the two new board members, I just wanted to provide this slide to, to orient you to the project overall and into the area we're talking about. Um, this is the, the Scarborough Downs master plan overall. I've highlighted phase one down by route one, the, the lower end of your screen, um, and, and that's uh, well underway as I think everybody knows. Uh, this is phase two. This is the, uh, the Innovation Park in the, in the Payne Road Commercial Gateway area um, up along Payne Road into the northerly end of the project. Uh, Payne Road's here, Haggis Parkway is, is on the left, and then uh, Route 1 down at the, the southerly end. Uh, before we dive kind of into the, into the details, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the vision and character of the Innovation Park in particular. Um, it's been talked about as an industrial area, a light industrial area, a maker area, a lot of different names. Um, and we just wanted to, to, to dive into the details and clarify a few things, um, particularly around truck traffic. Um, the Innovation Park um, is intended to be more light industrial, manufacturing, um, there's processing, food processing is allowed for, as well as a variety of other commercial uses. So heavy truck traffic isn't a permitted use, or excuse me, heavy kind of um, distribution, warehousing, truck terminals aren't permitted uses. Um, so there certainly will be truck traffic, um, but it's not going to be sort of a repeat of Scarborough's Industrial Park or uh, much of what you see off of Muzzy Road. It's, the other uh, image on the slide is, is East Bayside, um, so it's not going to look exactly like East Bayside, but I think from a character standpoint, we think it's similar to, to what's happening on the peninsula in Portland. 
along 295 than say Washington Avenue. Um, and we think that sort of that eclectic mix of more kind of light industrial uses is more likely um, in an innovation park than the heavier industrial users um, that, that you typically see in industrial parks. Um, Jim Allen and Rocky both kind of touched on permitting where, we, where we've been, where we're going. Um, for the benefit of uh, the newer board members, I, I did want to cover this briefly. Um, we've been at sort of the design process for a while <coughs> in this part of the project. Um, and in this zone, there's an added layer of process. So before you get into subdivision like we're in right now, there's the plan development review process. So we went through that process wrapping up in December, and it started with a site inventory analysis last summer, uh, and then a couple of different master planning meetings where we really worked with the board on the, the overall framework of the subdivision and the layout, where the development areas are, um, and then culminated in December with an approval by the board, um, a conditional approval of the space and bulk standards. So in this zone, we established the space and bulk standards working with the board, unlike other districts. So those space and bulk standards, other kind of design criteria, were approved in December. And so since then, we've been implementing and designing this the subdivision plan consistent with those. So tonight, we have preliminary subdivision, and uh, we we're on track for um, and are planning on continuing to work with, with the board and the other agencies on a final subdivision, um, hopefully late spring, early summer as we fine tune our plans um, and also work with the state and federal permitting agencies. So um, the other levels of permit, and I know many of the board members are aware, um, but I'll just touch on this. Um, in addition to obviously subdivision review, we're currently at main DEP for site location of development. Um, and so the DEP is conducting their review of our stormwater design, um, of our natural resource um, you know, conservation and re natural resource items, items like historic preservation, which they coordinate with um, the state agencies on. And so all of the site law review criteria is kind of occurring at DEP. In addition, we have a Natural Resource Protection Act permit uh, into DEP for wetland impacts to get access to the Innovation Park and to widen the Scarborough Downs Road. And that same permitting occurs with the Army Corps of Engineers. So we're working with them on, on those wetland impacts and, and mitigation for those. Um, in addition, uh, as has been noted, Maine DOT um, is underway with the review of our traffic movement permit. Uh, we've actually had two different kind of pre-scoping meetings with them and the town and the town's peer reviewer together. Um, so we're all reviewing it uh, as a team. At the same time, the, the plan is to have a scoping meeting in the next few weeks. And so a lot of the transportation, particularly the off-site transportation items, we're not going to cover this evening in detail um, because that process is still underway. And we need to get to our scoping meeting first before we have final details around um, some of those improvements. Um, in addition, our traffic engineers on vacation in the Bahamas. So that's two different reasons. <laughs> um, so that's the status of our state level permits. Um, and uh, a few other items that we've been working with staff on and also um, the other utility agencies are a master slash campus signage plan. So rather than presenting the signage plan as part of preliminary subdivision, um, this entire project really warrants an overall signage plan. Um, so at the advice of staff, we're preparing such a plan so that uh, we establish signage for phase one and phase two and have a relationship there. And we're going to review that with the board as a separate matter and get your review and feedback um, at, I think, at your, probably your next meeting. I touched on sort of the off-site traffic improvements. Um, that's, again, underway. We've been working on a phasing plan for um, some initial improvements along Payne Road, and then a phase two as this part of the project builds out, and we're working with DOT and, the, and town staff on, on the details of that. Um, and at the same time, we're coordinating with the sanitary district. They've been involved in the design of the sanitary, the, the sewer system, the sanitary system, 
as well as the Portland Water District on how this area will be served by public water. Um, one final point on in terms of future reviews is also that although the subdivision will approve all the lots, each lot's going to come in for a site plan review process. Um, so that's why in, in some cases there's not a lot high level of detail on the sites because they're not designed yet. They trigger site plan review. <coughs> and um, another component is, and we can talk, talk about it further, is that um, with the subdivision, we're actually designing the lots so that it's expected that the lot lines um, will be merged over time or lot boundaries adjusted because the subdivision is designed to accommodate different size users and that lots can be com combined or divided um, really intentionally. I can touch on that next. This is a quick rendering of, of how we see um, you know, how this area could build out. Um, at your lower right is, is the layout that the board's seen before. Um, and the way the lots are configured is that they're generally an acre in size, at least the light industrial lots, with the intention of pro accommodating a 10 to 15,000 square foot um, light industrial user, commercial user. But they can be easily combined to accommodate like double that or triple that so that um, the lots are really modular and can be merged over time um, based on who becomes interested in the, in the park um, and, and who comes online. So the, the upper left shows some scenarios you know, with some buildings that are 15, 10 to 15,000 square feet, others are <coughs> 30 to 40 to 50, really based on, based on demand in the marketplace. So given the kind of the size of the project, um, we wanted to start with really kind of a high level breakdown of what are the numbers for, for this phase of the project. So overall, it's about 158 total acres, plus or minus, depending on what you count within this phase. Um, and within that, there's three lots proposed and roughly 22 acres um, of the the Payne Road Commercial Gateway area, so the area close to Payne Road and along the Downs Road as you come into the project from the north. That area is shown in, in red. And then there's the Innovation Park, that's the, the light industrial um, manufacturing area. And that's about 80 acres, uh, made up of about of um, a, a total of 54 lots, or up to 54 lots, depending on how they're used. In addition, there's uh, approximately 54 acres of conservation land or common land. Um, in terms of overall infrastructure, there's a little bit more than a mile of public street, so you know, 5,500 linear feet of public street proposed, about 4,400 linear feet of sidewalk. There's close to two miles of trails proposed, and that's an important amenity. Uh, for the project, um, as well as the many for the town and for, for those seeking to, to get to Warren Woods. And using that resource, it doesn't have good access today. And then around uh, 4,000 uh, linear feet of private drives, or up to, depending on whether all those private drives are built um, all the way out. In terms of the, the lot characteristics, um, and this was reviewed um, as part of the master plan is these lots are being designed to accommodate up to 80% impervious cover on these lots um, and up to 95% of um, development coverage or development can occur um, through our application to Maine DEP through site law. And there's a range of lot sizes from close to 20 acres for that lot one, which is that large uh, lot close to Payne Road where we anticipate uh, more of a, a retail commercial type user down to uh, 39 to 40,000 square feet. And those are an acre or a little less is what's been planned for a lot of the light industrial lots. In terms of the street system, um, <coughs> the, the, um, the proposed design would improve the Scarborough Downs Road from um, where it intersects with Payne Road down a little over a thousand feet and it would widen uh, the Downs Road to accommodate the requisite turning lanes and the traffic anticipated with this phase of the project at full build out 
to provide access down to where Innovation Way intersects um, with the Scarborough Downs Road improvements. So this is about a thousand feet of um, improvement to what's now a private driveway into uh, a public space. And then from here, um, designing Innovation Way as a public street that would provide access to the Innovation Park and all the lots within the Innovation Park. And that's about 4,400 uh, linear feet. And then there would be another public street that would uh, traverse down, that would intersect with future development within the Downs. Um, in orange are the private drives that we're proposing to provide access to uh, each of the lots within Innovation Park, both the frontage lots, the lots along the public street, um, and just as importantly, or more importantly, to provide access to what we're calling the back lots. So the lots to the rear um, of these private drives don't have street frontage. They have access through these private driveways. Um, and that was a design approach that we worked on um, in collaboration with the town early on around still having a pretty generous amount of public street, but kind of trying to minimize the amount of public street um, and having um, some private streets that would be owned and maintained by the association within this project, by the lot owners of these uh, light industrial lots. It also provides the project flexibility around not having to build the entire street. If there's a larger user to the rear, then maybe the, the private drive's only half as long as you see on the plan. Um, one of the kind of nuances with the private drives is their easements across the lots. So they don't have right-of-ways like you typically think of for a public street or a private street. So they're, they're, they're designed to street standards, but they um, have easements across the lots. One of the questions that the staff has had, um, the planning board's had, um, as this project's being phased is What's the status of the Downs Road um, that we're not improving? So this, this plan um, up, up top here shows uh, to the left with phases one and two, which are currently uh, the, the aspects of the project designed and being permitted or under construction, that the existing Scarborough Downs Road, which is here, and it's being rebuilt, I think as, as the board is well aware, in phase one, and will be rebuilt as part of phase two, um, the construction for phase two would stop a little bit past where the Downs Road uh, connects to the south. And between this improvement and this improvement, the Downs Road, um, which is currently private, uh, we want to work with the town providing an access easement to allow the public to use it like many have used in the past, um, but not make significant improvements to it um, for the time being. And um, but enable uh, traffic to distribute as they would. Instead of going around Payne Road down Haggis Parkway, they can use the Downs Road to get to Route 1 and vice versa up to Payne Road. As <coughs> time goes on, this road will be rerouted and improved. Um, so in Phase 2, this road would remain, would be open to the public, um, and this yellow route would be an emergency access for uh, the fire department and, and others, emergency response to as an alternative access way to the innovation way, a second means of, means of access. As this project builds out and we get into future phases, particularly in the core of the project, um, the Downs Road will be improved with this alignment and then connect down to Route 1. Innovation Way will connect as such. And our plan right now working with the environmental agencies is to actually eliminate the existing Downs Road and allow these wetland areas to kind of um, be uh, more contiguous and to have more of a natural, kind of go back to their natural state. Um, our intention is to try to maintain a, a rec path, a bike pedestrian facility, um, but to be, have what, much less of a footprint on, on the wetlands in that area. So that's the intention with the phasing of the Downs Road and its, its use over time. One of the questions and discussion points and staff comments um, is around 
kind of the intersection of the Downs Road and Payne Road and access uh, into the front lots. So lot one, lot 1A, uh, 1B, lot 1A and 1B are intended to be frontage lots, uh, uses along Payne Road. Um, again, primarily retail, commercial type uses. Um, a service station is, is, is an opportunity, a potential there. And so the design here is um, to make significant improvements to the Downs Road, to provide adequate turn lanes um, to serve the entire phase, um, while at the same time distribute traffic and not over uh, burden or create congestion at any one of the access points to, to this lot or to these collection of lots. So the intention is um, coming on the coming down the, the Downs Road from Payne Road and vice versa. There would be um, queuing up to to Payne Road, uh, leaving the site. But as you enter, there would be an opportunity to take a left into Lot One, um, two thirds of the way down the Downs Road before Innovation Way. There'd be an access point off of Innovation Way. This is the road that goes over to the Light Industrial Park um, to provide access um, from that street. And also to have a, a protected right in, right, right out to uh, these two lots and, and ultimately lot one off of Payne Road. Um, and that, again, provides an opportunity to distribute traffic to not overburden any one of the um, any one of the access points, and also to provide more convenient access to, to the frontage lots. These are items that we're going to talk about in depth um, with Maine DOT and the town through the traffic movement permitting process before we come back to the board for, for final review. I'm going to quickly walk through the, the public utilities, um, public water network you see uh, on your screen. Uh, the, the site, there is public water out in Payne Road, so there's going to be a 16-inch water line that's extended from Payne Road down the Downs Road to serve, um, I would say, the, the westerly sort of half of <coughs> Innovation Park, and then that 16-inch water line is going to um, uh, go down towards the town center and will be extended as the project continues. Um, there'll be a 12-inch water line that serves the rest of uh, Innovation Park, and then eight-inch water lines that feed these private drives and would be implemented based on what happens on those lots. In terms of public sewer, um, there is not public sewer today up on Payne Road. So um, the sewer line will actually be connecting down to the highest Parkway for this, this phase of the project. So there'll be an eight-inch sewer line that would serve Lots 1A, 1B, and 1, um, and also um, serve much of Innovation Park. On the easterly end of the Innovation Park, there'll be a low pressure system and force mains that, that serve that area. Um, there'll be eight inch uh, gravity mains that will serve kind of the central core of the Innovation Park, and then a 12 inch uh, sewer line that will um, traverse to a pump station that then jumps to this plan, which shows um, from that pump station in the short term, there'll be a force main that's proposed that will that really traverse the core of the site and go out to Haggis Parkway. Um, and that's been through significant coordination with David Hughes and the Sanitary District as to uh, how best to, to connect into Haggis Parkway and the existing collection system. In terms of stormwater areas, um, the stormwater infrastructure is is been designed um, and has been geared around the phasing of this um, this development in, in this park. Uh, we don't expect to, um, and nor does I think Rocky want to spend the capital to build it all in one shot. So uh, this has been designed to be easily phased, and we'll show you a phasing plan a little bit later. Um, but what's shown in the lighter green here is two-thirds, essentially, of the, the Innovation Park has uh, been designed uh, to be managed by uh, this stormwater pond here. Um, and this design has been 
based on a lot of coordination with uh, Jeff Dennis at DEP, also Angela, the town engineer, um, and other members of DEP around how they wanted us to, to manage and treat stormwater based on the watersheds that this, um, this property affects. Um, and it's been designed to, I think, and Doug can get into more details, but essentially 90 or 95 percent of the stormwater has been deliberately directed to the Nunsuch watershed um, based on um, having concerns about impacting Mill Brook. And the design has been predicated on um, you know, preventing chlorides from enter entering the groundwater. Um, so this will be a lined pond that will manage the chlorides. Um, and this, again, this watershed will, will be um, conveyed to this pond and then outletted um, where there's topography. That, so there's about a 10 to 15 foot change in grade at this edge of the property, or this edge of um, the site. This the second pond uh, shown here um, will, uh, will manage and treat the storm water from this sort of third or um, area of and, and last phase or two <coughs> of the innovation park. There's also a, a small area that actually does uh, drain to the Millbrook watershed uh, down here. <coughs> and that area is um, treating just roof runoff um, from those back lots. Um, and we can get into more details with that with, with Doug and um, Drew if there's questions on stormwater. Jumping into to open space, um, that, that's been a really big consideration as we've laid out um, this phase of the project. And we first want to show a bit, con bit of context before we drill into more detail. Um, but we're, we have a, a really important neighbor in Warren Woods to the north and to the east and have designed our open space and our conservation lands accordingly. Um, Warren Woods is, is here. It's about 156, 160 acres of land trust conservation land. There's some additional conservation land. I think it's, I'm sure that most of the planning board members know up along the Nunsuch River. And this is the Nunsuch River um, floodplain and, and um, stream corridor. So we've geared our open space in this phase to, to uh, respect that and to, and to add to it uh, in a contiguous way. So we're jumping into to more details. I'm now into the details of the subdivision. We're um, proposing to conserve 25 acres here along the northerly edge of the parcel. And we've started conversations with the land trust about that actually go into the land trust so that can be added into the Warren Woods land holdings um, to, the, to the east. This is a 100 foot um, buffer that we're, um, per the ordinance, providing to provide additional conservation land along the land trust edge. That totals um, about eight and a quarter acres of open space and buffer. We'll have a trail system in the upland areas of this. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's going to be uh, conservation land, and we're proposing about 12 acres of open space um, along the Downs Road just south of Innovation Way. So that totals uh, 54 acres of open space. Um, 45 <coughs> of it is conservation land. Um, nine of it is sort of common lands where the stormwater pond is. So it's not like that's not wouldn't be undeveloped. Obviously, that's going to have stormwater infrastructure. Um, 33 acres of wetlands con conserved within these open spaces and also 33 additional acres that are really essentially um, Warren Woods um, additions to, to the Warren Woods property. So really kind of building off that open space um, is our, our pedestrian, our trail network. And we wanted to talk about that in more detail um, as that's some of the staff comments are around pedestrian infrastructure, sidewalks, et cetera, and also placemaking and thresholds within the project, which came up at master plan and we took seriously and want to, want to talk about in more detail. Um, so I mentioned early on that there's about two miles of loops trails. So the, the dashed lines show the network of trails that would, would um, circumnavigate the property um, and, and provide access 
within the open space in the project, but also access to Warren Woods and uh, properties, the property to the east. Along those lines, um, we're proposing two different trailhead parking areas that are um, fresh, that are uh, trailhead locations. There will be parking, there will be signage, there will be crosswalks. Uh, one, we want to provide early in the project um, as an early amenity um, shown here. And then one we're proposing at the end of Innovation Way to provide access, more direct access to Warren Woods. Along with the, the trails, um, we're also proposing a significant network of sidewalks. Um, and earlier in the presentation I mentioned we're, we're thinking about or we're planning for um, 4,400 linear feet of sidewalk. The extent of that sidewalk is a sidewalk we're proposing along Innovation Way from the Downs Road, the full length of Innovation Way on one side proposing a sidewalk um, from Innovation Way to the core of the project on one side until you get to a, a landscaped island area where we would have it on two sides. And we expect to the south, um, development, the character of development will change where it's more typical to have sidewalks on both sides. It'll be denser development, probably residential, mixed with commercial versus light industrial. Um, our feeling is that Given the fairly low density nature of light industrial um, versus denser residential uh, or intense commercial, that a sidewalk on one side is appropriate for the amount of pedestrian activity we're going to get. Um, and we really want to invest kind of wisely in our infrastructure and put it where people use it. So we're proposing that sidewalk, again, along the public streets and on one side, which we think is is appropriate. Um, we're also proposing sidewalk connections through site plan review to all of the development that occurs on lot one and lot one A and one B. That's really where pedestrians are going to want to go. Is they're going to want to go from where there's development to where there's other development. So rather than proposing sidewalks along the Downs Road, which is going to have wetlands on both sides and lead you out to um, a very auto-oriented pain road, we're proposing to, to have the sidewalk innovation way and then provide connections uh, into lot one reviewed through site plan review. We're providing the sidewalk along innovation way also to plan for that future bike ped facility we want to put on the existing Scarborough Downs Road, which will bring you back to the <coughs> core of the project. So that's what this is showing here as a plan for a pedestrian loop to be implemented once we're into that phase. Um, in addition, we're proposing that there be sidewalks and walkways incorporated as part of site plan review when various lots come in on these private drives. Um, we think in some cases it'll make sense to have a sidewalk along a private drive. In other cases, it may make sense to connect the doors and the buildings uh, within each of these lots and have walkways follow where people are going to use them, kind of building to building versus along a private drive. So we'd ask the board to consider you know, reviewing our pedestrian plans um, as part of site plan review when we get into the individual lot development in this area of the project. In terms of the cross sections, and I know some board members have seen this before, um, but our street design with Sidewalks um, in bicycle lanes is, is such. So um, with the typical street cross-section for Innovation Way and the public streets is to have 11-foot travel lanes, 5-foot bike lanes, um, esplanades, and then a sidewalk on one side, like I was just discussing. Um, but for in those couple gateway areas where you're coming into, uh, into the project or leaving the project where we would have a center island um, as designed. During master plan, we talked a lot about placemaking. So um, we've incorporated that, that theme, um, and established three or four different places along Innovation Way and along the project. Um, this is proposed as really kind of a gateway treatment um, coming into Innovation Way to have a business directory sign, to have a pull-off 
um, for those that are getting their mail. So there's going to be gang mailboxes to serve all the light industrial lots um, and to have um, really kind of a threshold feature coming into the project um, right near that, um, that turn lane in connection to lot one. The second one is proposed is that, that trailhead um, parking area early in the project. This is where the trail crosses Innovation Way, and we're proposing a, a crosswalk here. Um, we can work with Public Works on, on the treatment of that, whether that's flush or, or raised. Um, we do want this to kind of be more of a complete streets approach, so we want to establish traffic calming measures uh, as you come into the project. So we're actually... Um, we, we feel pretty strongly that um, parallel on-street parking makes sense here um, and think that's an important design feature if this is going to be a pedestrian space and it is going to calm traffic as you come into the project. So uh, we want to talk more about the appropriateness of on-street parking with the board here um, because we think that um, it's an important amenity as you come into the project. It also lessens the impervious area of, of parking in general, and it can be accommodated with less kind of impact on adjacent wetlands. So um, we think it, it can work here with, with good design. So that's what's proposed at this, at this point. There also would be a trailhead signage and kiosk that we'd work with the land trust on. And then the third uh, key kind of placemaking uh, element that we've added to the plan is right at that initial four-way intersection coming into the park. Um, at this location, we're proposing two easement areas on the two sub corners. Um, so these aren't actually changing the lot lines. These would be easements on the corners of these two lots where we do enhanced landscaping, um, some sitting areas, and uh, a four-way kind of crosswalk treatment at this intersection. Again, as much uh, you know, for pedestrian safety is also providing traffic calming, a different texture as you're driving into this intersection to slow people down um, and, and uh, take notice. In terms of phasing, staff asked about this, and we've been thinking a lot about the approach to phasing. Um, and this is our preliminary phasing plan at this preliminary stage of the project. Uh, in blue is the Payne Road Commercial Gateway area. Those are the, the larger lots up, by, up on the corner. Those are really going to be phased on their own. They're going to they're gonna come in um, to the board for site plan and then move forward with development really based, driven by users. Um, and and when, the, when the team establishes a, a, some end users that that make that corner viable. Um, so there isn't a set cadence to when that phase occurs. Um, but what we do know is it certainly triggers site plan review. It's also going to trigger additional DEP review around um, potential wetland impacts. And um, based on our work with DOT and, and offsite uh, traffic improvements, it, it would likely relate to the second phase of pain road improvements uh, that would be warranted given the, the higher traffic volumes associated with commercial development versus light industrial. The first phase that's planned is, given the um, uncertainty of the blue and the, the timing, is that initial uh, first phase in the light industrial, so that yellow phase. That would occur, uh, again, the stormwater pond um, would be in this area, would be implemented as part of that first phase, and then we would establish a, a temporary turnaround um, at Innovation Way at this location. The second phase is likely this collection of, of lots in the middle of the Innovation Park, and then the third phase would be this, this darker blue that then would trigger the need to make improvements, um, the stormwater improvements, that second pond. Um, there also could be sub-phases of this overall phasing plan as time goes on. So. I guess in conclusion, um, that's really where we are on, on the design and uh, engineering for the preliminary subdivision. Um, we've got a lot of, we received and reviewed all of uh, staff and peer review comments. Uh, the vast majority of them 
we've either already addressed or can easily address prior to final subdivision. They were um, uh, appropriate and, and fairly easy to address. Um, um, so this evening, we, we wanted to talk to the board about some of the harder ones. Um, and uh, we, we understand where the staff comments came from uh, in large part, but there's also some um, kind of team perspectives that we'd like to talk to the board about on, on how these are implemented. Uh, I mentioned the trailhead parallel parking. Um, we'd, we'd like to talk more about that. We think it um, makes sense in this context. Uh, we also think that because this isn't a typical industrial park, that's going to be 50% uh, truck traffic. Um, that truck traffic really isn't the necessarily should be the design driver of, of how parking is handled. Um, based on our research, I think 15 to 20% of traffic in this, in this light industrial area is going to be kind of truck oriented. Um, I talked about the public sidewalks. Um, we, we think that um, the, the layout of sidewalks I'm proposing um, and having it on one side in, in most places and the connections to the town center, and that's where you really add more sidewalk and pedestrian infrastructure is appropriate. Also given the, really the lack of any destination for pedestrians along Payne Road now and, and likely into the future, um, and about doing walkways uh, on the private drives or individual lots as site plan occurs. Um, our landscape architect worked hard on providing street trees, I think, wherever possible, probably to the more than Rocky would like to admit. <laughs> um, and really the only reason we didn't have street trees along all of the public streets was really wetland impacts. So there are some gaps where we didn't provide street trees really because we're trying to minimize wetland impacts and not grade into wetlands to, to plant trees that we think are going to actually grow in because those would be conserved areas. Um, we're going to incorporate um, more transit <coughs> details, uh, we're working with the transit agencies and trying to figure out who, who best is to serve um, the, this end of the project in the short term and as part of the traffic movement permit process we'll figure out where the bus stop is and, and get that squared away before final approval. We've also been working hard on street names um, and are, are getting close and are getting ready to approach uh, the police department on on our list of street names, we'll get those figured out before final. Um, there was a staff comment around wetland impacts on lot one and putting it on the subdivision plan. Um, we've done that for all the other lots within um, the subdivision, but this is the lot that well, we don't know what the user is going to be and we don't know what the layout exactly is going to be. So at this point, we want to delay that until site plan review when we know actually what we're actually working with in terms of a layout and access once you get past the, the curb cut locations. Um, and, and the last point I touched on briefly is access points for lot one. Um, I presented those to the board and we'd like to continue on with, with the proposal as to how we're getting into lot one as part of the traffic movement permit process and have that um, have that squared away and incorporated into that review um, before the board sees the plan again. So uh, I apologize for the long presentation. I wanted to cover a lot of territory. And I think at this point, I'll turn it back to the board. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we do have opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this issue, I ask that you please approach the podium and give us your name and some of your thoughts. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Robin, would you like to go at this first? Oh my goodness, sure. Um, a couple of things. I, I'd just like to compliment you on a, a job well done. I think it's you're, you guys are coming along really well. I think you've gotten your stride and as far as the downs are concerned. And um, you know, one of the, one of the, the uh, comments, the last comment on page five of five uh, staff had said that um, you should continue to include response to comments. I thought that Appendix 4 was fabulous, where you just keep adding on to the staff comments. To, and it helps to remind us on the planning board of what we've covered before and where we're going kind of a thing. So if you could <coughs> continue that 
format, if that seems appropriate kind of thing. I think that's great. Um, um, question about open space. Um, I know there's 55 acres of open space. Um, are 33 of the 55 acres wetlands? Or is it 33 acres of wetlands plus 55 acres of open space? I, I wanted to know if the 55 was inclusive of the wetlands. 55 includes 33 of wetlands, correct. Okay. Yep. Got it. So then there's really only 22 acres of upland kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I shouldn't say only. It's still um, pretty significant. With respect to the wetlands mitigation, I noticed that it's over, uh, I think, on, on figure S. 001 that there is something like over 50,000 square feet of wetland impacts. Am I, there is. Am yep, I right? That's okay. Correct. Okay. And so that I'm wondering are that triggers, you know, like a tier 2 sort of army corps permit. So I'm wondering are you going down the mitigation route or the in lieu fee program route? We've talked to the we're in the midst of army corps review. Okay. Um, it's underway, and at this point, we're proposing mitigation through um, okay. conveying and protecting the, the 25 acres okay. that we're offering to the land trust, okay. which includes, it's about three acres of upland yep. and 22 of wetland, okay. um, and those are ongoing discussions. So that could be accepted, or it could be a combination yep. of... Of both of preservation and in Luffy in Luffy and yeah. and I guess what I wanted to get out there is um, to be proactive um, I've, I've seen in other communities that <coughs> if there is a project in Scarborough where we could do off-site mitigation instead yeah. of paying the in Luffy it would be really great if those dollars didn't leave Scarborough yeah. is, is sort of what I'm uh, you know I'm sort of hinting at if, if there's any way to do that and I know that um, some, you know, land trusts and things like that are very open to those types of dollars. And normally, you know, the, the Nature Conservancy holds that, that money for folks and then it goes out throughout the entire yep. state. So The Scarborough Land Trust brought that up when oh, we talked about <laughs> this partnership. Yeah. So, yeah. so in, we're going to continue to work with them on perfect. if that... If we do in the fee, that it can be funneled directly yeah. to them. But, but that's great, too, that you're trying to do mitigation <clears throat> to the maximum extent. Yeah. Uh, practical for the site kind of thing. Um, one of my last questions has to do with, guess what? From our Doug. I know. Right. <laughs> Hi there, Doug Reynolds. Good to see you. Just a quick question about uh, what the staff is saying about the feeder lines. Um, it's at the bottom of page four of five. Um, can, can I assume that the, that the homeowners, no, the association. Commercial association, that's, that's my understanding. Yeah, we'll have the, the ponds, but will it include the feeder lines as well? We're still working on, see the next step we have is to collaborate with Rocky's attorney on putting together those okay. agreements. Okay. So Good. Um, we want to have those conversations. Good. Um, yeah. I think you're really on the right track. I'll leave... I'll leave some other ideas about connectivity and all the other sort of topics that, that you had talked about for my peers. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Rob. Rachel. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me say that with all of this material, I think you folks have broken the record okay, in terms of amount, size, and I think comprehensiveness as well. Um, so as, as I talk, I may have some difficulty finding what I'm referring to in, in this large uh, amount of stuff, but I really appreciate the work and the effort that you put into it. Let me ask a, a question about the trail um, near, <clears throat> what's that first lot, is it three? Two. Uh, yeah, that well, finger. Both. Yeah, the finger lock. Yeah, and, and the trail. Are, are you going to be building, um, what's that trail going to look like? It's going to have boardwalks or? This trail is going to be more of a natural trail, so like bark mulch type trail, low impact trail. Um, it's mostly on upland, um, and there'll be boardwalks or short bridges, the narrow places it needs to cross a wetland. There's minimal wetland impacts with the trail, but there's a couple places it needs to skip over a wetland. Okay. Uh, I also uh, really appreciate the effort that you put into the placemaking 
but um, I, I even got out my magnifying glass, which is just one of these little neat things. And I can't necessarily tell if you have benches at all of these traffic calming areas. For instance, where you've got the uh, gang mailboxes. Are there benches there? The intention is benches in the landscape plan. We Sometimes the engineers haven't caught up with all the landscaping details um, at preliminary stage, but the intention is to have sitting areas at these placemaking locations. We've been talking about doing kind of a concrete um, type um, seat wall um, that's kind of of a light industrial character um, that could match in with signage and some other things that we're going to present to the board in the future. Um, so yeah, the intention is to have some resting spots. All right, how about at the trailheads, at that parking area at the trailheads? Yes. Benches so there as well? The, this is where you're referring. Um, and the, that's what these, these are seat walls slash benches in this location. Okay. All right, I think, uh, I think you've done a, a thoughtful job there. It's tough to do that in an, an industrial park, but um, I think you've integrated. Innovation park. Mm -hmm. Innovation park. Innovation park. Uh, I th and I, I, I think you have been innovative there. Um, I also uh, note what you did on one of the many uh, plans. Um, you had proposed building orientations, uh, and I think at the last meeting, one of the things I asked you to take a look at was to ensure that uh, when you look down some of these streets, you just didn't see a row of cars and parked all the way down. And I noticed that you had um, put some uh, some innovative rearrangements of of the buildings on those on those sites, and I, I thank you for doing that. I think. Uh, that adds as well to the, the sense of innovation there. Um, now we come to, uh, I guess, what is a, a tough area, uh, and that is lot one. Uh, at the last time you were before us, I know I expressed some concerns that there was 20 acres sitting there uh, with nothing, uh, with no just 20 acres, blank. Might as well have said, here there be dragons, uh, the old maps used to do. Uh, and now you're proposing um, to subdivide that with uh, two lots at fronting on Payne Road. Uh, I took a look at the Crossroads plan development uh, area uh, outlines or ordinances and it very clearly in these ordinances talks about uh, direct vehicular access from individual building sites onto Route 1, Payne Road, or new collector sites within the district must be restricted. Site access shall be designed in accordance with the Site Plan Review Ordinance. And that's Section 20C, Number 7, uh, on access management and interconnections. It also talks about the relationship of buildings to the street. Uh, and it addresses the fact that the planning board must find that the proposed development standards will result in a development that has a village character rather than a suburban commercial character. And as I look at some of your sketches for lots 1A and 1B with proposed access to Payne Road, it kind of disturbs me because what it seems to me to be is though it's the beginning of a strip mall. Mm -hmm. If there are two lots right along Payne Road, right along the gateway, and the gateway to the crossroads development from Payne Road starts off with two commercial facing the street, facing Payne Road, uh, commercial buildings, a gas station perhaps, a convenience store, whatever that may be, that's jarring uh, in relationship to the planning involved in the integration of the rest of this development. Um, the access to Payne Road brings me back to 
memories of other discussions this board has had when there are two possible road entrances or entrances onto two possible roads. And as I look, it looks as though the only thing you're thinking about right now is the access to Payne Road. And without seeing alternatives, it would be very difficult for me to vote in favor of that sort of an access at this point. I would like to see what else you're going to be doing with that lot. I'm glad that you did show uh, some of the um, utility, um, at least the sewer line mm -hmm. access. Uh, I don't see water, I don't see electrical. There's a lot, obviously, that's going to come with those lots. But to have the initial subdivision of that 20 acres come as two commercial lots facing Payne Road with access on Payne Road is very troubling. So this particular area of the project is the only area that allows gas stations. So under zoning, um, if this site's going to have a gas station, um, this, is where, this is the only location that it can. Um, and the intention for these smaller <coughs> lots is to follow the zoning um, to potentially have a service station in this location. Uh, I think the town's commercial design standards are <clears throat> very robust when it comes to the design of those types of facilities. Um, and that was talked about with the rezoning that allowed for service stations only in this one spot on the entire project that can kind of get at your concern around design and presentation to the street. Um, and I remember talking a lot about that as being, um, you know, having fairly strict requirements around where the buildings go versus the canopies. Um, so it shouldn't be unexpected that there be a gas station or kind of an auto, um, auto type use here. And this is really the most auto end of the project that there is um, along Payne Road. So the intention here is to there isn't a user, so we can't, you know, design the, the site. The intention is to um, kind of show the board where those access points are and to, to kind of best lay out um, those access points so that it's predictable moving forward. And then the board gets into site plan review that, that gets at kind of village character and architecture so that it's a, an attractive location. You do have, however, access potential from the Downs Road, correct? And that would keep it within the zoning? In other words, say the, if that's the location that the zoning addresses in, in let's say, 1A or 1B, does the zoning say that there can't be an access from another road, or must the, must the access to those two lots be from Payne Road? Are you saying the zoning requires the access to be from Payne Road? Um. I'm not saying the zoning requires the access to be from Payne Road. I, I don't, the, z the zoning doesn't say access is prohibited. The zoning says access is restricted. Um, and a protected right in, right out movement isn't, um, is a restrictive move movement in, in terms of, so I don't know that the zoning says you can't do it. It's, the zoning says you need to be restrictive in terms of how you manage Mobility but uh, what I'm asking is, there's a cut into the, there's a street cut and an entrance, actually two of them, into that 22-acre property, mm -hmm. correct? And why so is the access, why is that not used as the access to those two lots? This is going to provide access to lot one. It also can provide secondary access to these lots as well, depending on how this is all planned. So the zoning, the zoning doesn't prohibit the lo those buildings to be solely accessed from no. the Downs Road. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Go so ahead. that, that is, shouldn't be a surprise. It was a concern to me before um, because it's a lot of land that's tied up there the most visible entrance to the park, I mean, to the, the whole development 
and I think we owe it to the town and we owe it uh, to the future of the development to ensure that what goes there um, really suits the rest of the development. Uh, and that I, I understand that the rest of the lots aren't sold. I understand that it may be kind of higgledy-piggledy as you start to look at how you're going to subdivide that. But I have now expressed my concern about those two lots uh, facing Payne Road instead of facing the village part of that commercial area. I think if I could, if I could just jump in, I'd hopefully add a little bit to the conversation, but what we're proposing doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the buildings are going to front Payne Road and be focused to Payne Road. Um, I think we showed some concepts early on, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, about how that might develop out. I, I think the way we're showing the right in, right out on 1A and 1B may be a little bit uh, confusing. I see that road coming in and serving all of Lot 1. So that right in, right out may not just serve 1A, 1B, it's going to serve Lot 1 as well. There'll be connections, the points that we're showing off the Downs Road and off Innovation Park Road, that'll all get tied together um, as part of that uh, plan for the development mm -hmm. of 1A, 1A, 1B. Is that multiple curb cuts? I apologize for jumping in. But are you saying that there's multiple curb cuts for B, 1B and 1A? There's one curb cut on Payne Road to serve those lots, but they'll also be served from within Lot 1. So there's not independent curb cut for 1B and an independent curb cut for 1A? There's it's not. Shared. It's shared. It's, it's shared. shared. Okay. And I guess I'm with, I'm with Rachel, and I apologize for jumping in, but I guess I would need guidance from staff on why aren't we using the access road versus Payne Road when we just had to do this for hospice and several others i guess that's a as it's a question to board as as it was stated that the standards do say to be restricted not prohibited and so i guess the question to the board is you know is a right in right out that's protected i think as they're saying and that's the detail that's still to be sort of fleshed out through the dot and the town review processes okay. you know is there you know what, what prohibits those left turns, because that's typically our concern, and yep. frankly, how does the right in, right out sort of help facilitate the intersection at Payne and Downs Road? Does it? I, I don't know that we know the answer to that yet, but I do think I'm hearing some of the concern expressed by Ms. Hendrickson is, is the fact that right now, as we look at the plan, it looks like that right in, right out terminates right on 1A and 1B, and we don't understand that connectivity, that overall connectivity, and so maybe through further vetting that and maybe, you know, and so not to say that the board, um, you know, whatever the board's decision in, on, on the right in, right out along Payne Road, I do think the board has the ability to um, permit that if you find it sort of meets all sorts of other rationale and so maybe the applicant could, you know, do some additional work in terms of showing those further connections. Maybe there's some more discussion around some, what the landscaping along Payne Road looks like just to address some of those concerns and maybe that that starts to get at it maybe it doesn't go far enough but at least it's yeah you know, I, I I don't want the applicant to leave here thinking that we were happy with what the that proposal is yep. um, and that while it could be part certainly part of the discussion with the mm -hmm. DOT um, I usually don't favor that sort of a, a second the second access. We already have two accesses into uh, lot one proposed, and now you're setting up a third um, with the access between lot 1B and 1A. So any further approvals, at least as far as I'm concerned, I need a lot more information on what it's going to look like, how it's going to complement the entrance to the downs instead of appearing as, I said, you know, first two buildings of a strip mall. Um, so I would like to see more information. I would like to see some hard data around the traffic. Um, we would have to make a decision uh, as to whether we would agree on that, uh, on that uh, cut, uh, on that access because we now have essentially 
two lots that are pretty much on a corner served by two streets, and the question becomes which street is the best one for the egress and entrance of those lots, into those lots and the rest of lot one. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we certainly understand that um, and, and take your comments well. Uh, it's, that's, it's been sort of tricky in terms of when to present this information given the pending nature of the DOT process. So this is kind of wrapped up with all of the, the pain road improvements, phase one and phase two, to accommodate the traffic for this project. And um, so we'll come back with you, come back to you with more information around um, the rationale for the right in, right out, and what that means in terms of the site development. Um, so I understand your concern. Yeah, we'll also need obviously information on the rest of the utilities and. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, just along that similar vein, before we move on, what is the distance between the right in, right out to the corner of the Downs Road and the Payne Road? You know, approximate distance for that. Four hundred feet. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I don't have a lot. Most of the questions I had, I found the answers to in the uh, in the Bible here. So you guys do a really good job of um, documentation. So when I have questions, I can usually find it if I dig long enough. Um, I have two probably simple questions. One is regarding um, section 22, the, the auto turn. Um, so you did the auto turn. I'm, I'm guessing that these are just the, the only places that you really, the auto turns required um, based on documentation. Uh, I was just curious, once the, the truck turns down one of these these um, roads, right. how does it get, does it, can it, is it, is it able to turn around down here, just kind of back and in and out? Did you talk to the fire department about that at all? Or We have reviewed it with the fire department. We're going to review. Um, the plans again with the fire department around yeah. that, around fire hydrants and a few other things. Um, and we can um, add uh, turnaround locations. I think in most cases, what's going to happen is there's going to be driveway pullouts into the parking lots for each lot user. Yeah. Um, and those are going to be designed to meet the fire department needs anyway to get to those lots. Right. Um, but that's really kind of one of those things that we're probably going to handle as each site drive is constructed and we know what the site plans look like for along the, the private drives. Right. Okay, so that makes sense. So the auto turn obviously works at these main points and then potentially the truck will just go around the building or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, right. or case do a case. Or turn around at a driveway right. that has adequate turning races because okay. they're going to be designed to accommodate trucks in most cases okay. given the nature of the lots. So all that gets run by the fire department? at some point. Right. Okay. That's good. Um, and then the other question I had is regarding lighting. Um, you guys did a really good job with the lighting and the lighting plan and I like the lights and all that. Um, initially you show lighting going down the main, you know, down the main street um, yeah. and then no lighting on any of the other streets and that's obviously going to be phased in with the, as you, as you build it out. Um, but this being a you know an innovation park, um, I would I would just make a suggestion and, and and as we move forward with the project that these straight streets as you as you put them in you, you somehow light them a little bit if you know what I mean so you, you end up with if you have these it, it's if everything's well lit as you as you're working through it it just I think what tends to have less problems with, you know, mischief and whatnot. Right. Our intention was to, in, in many cases, have the lighting plan for each lot, um, light the, the driveway locations and how they intersect, intersect with, the, with the private drives um, so that these guys aren't putting in light poles in the wrong locations before development happens, that we put the lighting in as part of site development where it should go yeah. versus having to move it after right. after nice. a user comes online. So I think in a lot of cases, the lighting plan for each site plan will light up the private drive at, at the right locations, the, the proper locations. Yeah. 
I, you know, I imagine the way that you guys are doing this, the way it's well, well thought out and well laid out, these, this is going to be built out fairly quickly. It's just I wouldn't want Scarborough PD having to go down there every, you know, two hours to make a run through there be, because, you know, dark areas like that, there's not a lot of activity tended. You know how it goes. So if you could light it as you go, that would be great. But, you know, I know you're going to light each lot, each lot as, as needed, but just maybe light the street a little bit as you build it out. Um, again, your documentation is wonderful. And I like the plan and, and uh, everything that you're doing with the innovation part. Thank you. Jen. thought given to routing the bike lane, any proposed bike lanes to the left side of um, any right turn lane that's sort of proven to be beneficial from a safety standpoint. Um, might also consider given the um, length of time that we can get paint to stay in this part of the world, complementing that with a sign uh, that would just indicate drivers yielding to anyone in the bike lane making that movement. Um, and I noticed, and uh, again, I am I am a new face here, and so I was not in this seat through the master planning process, so I apologize if this has come up previously, um, but noticed that the five-foot width was called out on all, um, on all the bike lanes um, which is the minimum for bike lanes. Um, I would, I would just ask that if there was an opportunity to widen that even to six feet in any area, it's beneficial from a user standpoint, um, and also <coughs> particularly in the winter when we're plowing. Um, you, so, you know, unless snow maintenance is kept at the curb line, you generally lose about a foot of um, bike lane width, and I, my thought is that that, especially in a place like this, could um, discourage someone from using that facility in the winter when otherwise it might be available. Um, and also along the same lines, in, in any areas that <coughs> you're proposing on-street parking adjacent to the bike lane, and I know there's not many, but there are a couple. Um, that consideration be given to any additional buffer to that five foot bike lane um, just because of the potential conflict for um, doors and people activity getting in and out of cars. Um, which sort of brings me to my next question. The on street parking that you're showing, yes, here. Um, I'm curious why you chose to place this on that side of the street as opposed to the other side of the street where potentially you would have people parking and not needing to cross the road to access the trail network. Um, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is that across the street is a fairly narrow frontage for a development lot, one of the first development lots. And so we were concerned about conflicts between fitting on-street parking, the trailhead, and um, a curb cut uh, within that fairly short distance for, for a lot. I think it's lot three. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Uh, another reason is we were thinking that most folks using the trailhead are coming in from outside the project, and so they could park on the right. Um, as they come in, um, the other, um, you know, the other point to make is that there, this sidewalk does lead to the trail that goes to the other part of the project. Um, so, 
it's not as direct as you're as you're stating, but it does lead you to a tr depending on which where you're going. Sure, on right. The trail. And, but it's interesting that even just looking at your um, the graphics that you presented tonight and some of the material in here, my I or I just pictured myself sort of parking there and then crossing the road, I guess, to access maybe heading towards Warren Woods or whatever. Yeah. Um, some of the longer trail networks, so yeah. um, it's a good, you know, I do understand that that connects to um, other trail system, or trails on either side, but just that the safest way always to cross people is to not cross them. <laughs> um, but I think some of your suggested treatments here will certainly help to that end, in addition to providing traffic calming elements um, through that stretch. Um... The parking that you are proposing at the end of Innovation Way, again for tr for trailhead parking. Um, so the comment was raised earlier about truck turning at the end of these private ways, <laughs> which I understand the explanation there, but I would just be curious about um, truck circulation and sort of more specifically, I guess, emergency services and plowing, trash, things like that at this, at the end of this otherwise public way. Um, and I'm sure that will come out in your conversations with the fire department. But um, if, you know, if this trailhead was completely full, I guess, of parking, does that still apply? And that's the first part of my question. And the second part is, is there an opportunity there if, approve if a parking demand is proven to exceed this is there the opportunity to expand that at all or does the rest of the build out or trail network or whatever there preclude that um, <clears throat> I, I think there's certainly an opportunity to expand the parking if it's wildly popular we're actually lengthening the the, the turnaround um, at the request of public works um, so maybe you have to lengthen it some more <laughs> to get past additional parking. Um, but you know, I think there's opportunities for adding to that the quantity of parking. We did actually shift it to the left side versus the right at the request of Public Works because <coughs> we originally had it on the other side and that interfered with um, plowing and where they, they pile snow. So we've coordinated with them on where it goes at the dead end um, to minimize the impact on public service. We'll check back in with the fire department. Um, we're going to meet with them on a variety of things. So that's a good point that we'll check I mean, check I hope on. it's popular enough that you need extra parking. But right. <laughs> <coughs> um, I think I just have one other comment. Well, I just, I come from a bike ped pe background in general, and so I just really appreciate the thought, you know, you um, do comparisons earlier on to, to East Bayside in Portland, which is similar in some ways and drastically different in others. Generally that it's built, it's already been built up over time right. and there are a number of things lacking. I think the bike ped facilities are one of the greatest in addition to some drainage problems. <laughs> but, um, you know, the usage down there is certainly changing like almost by the day and it just seems that that is something you won't have to deal with here because of some forethought. So I, I think the, the town and, and these um, tenants and residents and everyone using this space will, will stand to benefit from that. Um, lastly, the long straight stretch of Innovation <coughs> Way um, strikes me as something that could be, could have the potential for some speeding challenges mm -hmm. or just generally, you know, fast, um, traffic movements, yeah. truck turning, things like that. Um, and so, I, you know, the street trees certainly act in a way to help traffic calming. Just wondering if you've given any other consideration to additional traffic calming elements beyond the street trees. Uh, we've talked about it. We've talked about crosswalk locations kind of leading into the to the private drives and where future sidewalks go. Um, we've talked about doing kind of the same crosswalk pattern or something more prominent, um, but we haven't 
landed on anything yet. So, I mean, we're open to ideas. Um, I don't think we don't want it to, to be a speed zone. Um, so we want it to be comfortable for, for pedestrians that do cross the street and just sort of general activity. So if, if you have some ideas, we're open to hearing them. People. That would be my idea. <laughs> More activity. Add people? Yeah. <laughs> Is that it? That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Right. Well, I'm the real new guy on the block, so I'm just getting my feet wet on this, but uh, I've been watching what's been going on. Um, my real comments will probably be the next time you come here and there's a little more you know, what does the, the sites look like and what are we doing in terms of orientation and how much flat roofs are you thinking we're going to have versus some pitch roofs where we could uh, provide some alternative generation or distributed generation for that site, um, possibly placing service entrances on these buildings where there's a common area where we could do interconnects or something of that nature. But uh, for, at this point, I just assume uh, not talk and remove uh, doubt of my ignorance on, on some of the stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, so I guess that leaves me. I uh, I will agree that um, I feel like at this time that I would like to see some more detail on Lot 1, 1A, 1B. I think that, that is going to be important to how this proceeds. So, um, And then, you know, not to belabor some of the other points you've had, and you do definitely have uh, a healthy list of things from staff to uh, kind of tweak a little, uh, but I do have one question. It's, it is on the trailhead, trail end at the, yeah. the parking at the end of innovation. Um, I was I was concerned when I first saw it about truck movements, but we've covered that. Um, but two, uh, do you think that has the potential to be utilized by customers, employees, or something to try to access lot 20 and lot 40 easily? You know, if there was ever a building there, all the employees are starting to use trailhead parking, you know? Is there enough distinction there to stop that from happening? And I guess without seeing, you know, that built out, you have no idea what's going to go there. It's probably one of the last lots that gets developed. But um, I think keep that in mind as you go yeah. forward, that you don't, you know, you're trying to dedicate this to for something nice for public to use. Don't, you know, don't Occupy. design it in a way that yeah. becomes an employee parking lot. So good point. just a thought there. Yeah. Uh, outside of that, I mean, you guys, you're clearly, Dan, with your background and experience, you know um, what the staff, the town, and the planning board typically looks for. So uh, the amount of information you provided, the design plans, that you know, well done. Um, you know, you are setting a standard here, and we appreciate that. This is a big, you know, it's a big project right in the center and the heart of our town. So we do appreciate all this effort. And, uh, you know, I know you're seeking preliminary. Um, this, anyone on this board is free to make that motion for that this evening. Um, I I think there's probably enough here to tweak that we'd love to see you back in, in three weeks and, and then with a little bit more information to get you there. So that's my personal thought. Agreed. So. Agreed. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown doing business as Verizon Wireless requests a review of a transmission tower at 415 Black Point Road. Assessor's map R103, lot 17A. Jay. Um, Mr. Chair, if you yes. for one moment, I do need to recuse myself from this um, item as I am on the Friends of Scarborough Marsh Board. So I will join the audience at this time. Thank you. Thanks. Jay. Sure, thank you. Um, so let's see, this is actually, I believe now, going to be the fifth time the board has seen this application. Um, and so I won't belabor uh, the point too long, but um, it has been since October, so it's been a little while, so just a little history seems, seems useful. Um, so the applicant's before you with a proposal for a transmission tower uh, in the RF district, but it is in the transmission tower overlay. Uh, area on the sanitary district property down in Prouts Neck. Um, so as I noted, the 
applicant was before you last in October, um, and the board sort of started some of um, continued its review at that time. So just as a reminder, there's really sort of three steps or, um, to a review of this type, um, and they're spelled out in the ordinance, but the first step is a uh, to look at the priority of location and has the applicants sort of demonstrated that this location meets those um, set of criteria. This board by, by straw poll back in uh, September, I believe it was, found that they had met that threshold to continue forward. And so now the next two steps in the process are to really look at those review standards that are set forth in the ordinance um, with regards to um, sort of the specific elements, as well as the site plan review uh, ordinance. Um, so back in October, the board began its review of the remaining standards, and really there were some, the principal questions uh, staff heard them were really around sort of buffering, height, and how those relate to visual impacts. Um, and so at that point, the planning board had asked the applicant um, to go back and take a look at an alternative location on the property, as is um, the board's, uh, board does have that authority in the ordinance, um, and to, to run their sort of visual impact analysis with three different tower types. The board had asked uh, the, the applicant to also look at a stealth tower. This is a tower where the uh, antennas are internal, so really all you look at, it's been referred to as a brown stick. Um, so the applicant has provided additional materials uh, to that effect, and I'm sure they'll go through that as part of their presentation. Um, staff's provided um, a series of comments, but I do, as I said, I think those were really the principal elements, and there are certainly some other elements to work through. So really what we're hoping for from the board tonight is to get further guidance um, as the applicant sort of works towards, and the board works towards um, uncovering if the standards of the ordinance can be met, and that can help inform what type of uh, direction um, any motion may take at a future future discussion. So, thank you, Jay. So, with that, great. Thanks very much, and thanks, Jay, for the intro. Um, Scott Anderson for uh, Verizon Wireless, and again, I'm here this evening with uh, Chip Fredette who does uh, site acquisition, as well as Keith Valente, who is our radio frequency engineer. As Jay noted, we, we, just because we have a couple of new members, I'm going to go through um, the plan very briefly just to make sure everybody's up to speed on what we're proposing. Um, generally, what we propose is a 100-foot tower um, at 415 Black Point Road. This is a sanitary district site. Um, this, um, sorry about that. this slide shows generally um, the location um, of, the, uh, of the proposed tower um, kind of behind the sanitary district uh, development. The marshes uh, in the upper left of, the, of this site plan that, that you've seen. And this location right here, which shows the setbacks, is the so-called um, Plan A location. This is the one that we had initially uh, proposed for the board. Um, this is a bit of a blow up for the site. Um, we'll be coming in from um, Black Point Road, which is kind of to the lower right of this slide, um, along the existing driveway, and then turning off to the right with a new driveway extension to access um, the, the tower compound. Um, we have about a uh, 75 by 75 foot lease area. Within that, there's a 50 by 50 foot fence area that encloses really two main components of the project. One is the pole itself, and the second are the radio boxes, a backup battery, and a generator associated with some backup power for the site. Um, the focus of the proceeding has been largely on, um, on the tower and the tower design, um, but that gives you kind of a general sense of where the location of the so-called plan, uh, plan A location is. Um, this is a side view of uh, the monopole option, um, uh, showing our antennas at the top. Again, we went through it with some detail with the board previously about the need for the site and the need for the location here and the height of the tower. Um, 100 feet is a relatively low height for um, um, a um, kind of an initial build on a tower, but this um, elevation works for uh, Verizon Wireless, and which is why we're asking for a 100-foot uh, height. The ordinance allows uh, towers uh, to be 130 feet, and actually there's a provision that allows them to go a bit higher. Usually the goal for uh, the carriers and towns are 
um, tell us the lowest level you need uh, in order to meet your coverage objectives so you're not building something that's bigger than you need. So 100 foot is the tower height that we require. Um, the ordinance requires that the tower be constructed strong enough that it would hold three additional antenna arrays. And we've shown, just for kind of descriptive purposes, um, roughly where the three additional arrays would go. So the tower itself is designed to hold three additional um, antenna arrays. Um, we uh, Normally in a situation like this, we really don't have any idea what other carriers might be interested in. Um, the, the tower is designed um, to carry additional antennas, and the fenced-in area at, at the base has got enough room for other carriers to put their equipment, so it's set up that way. <clears throat> we have heard um, and have provided the board with some letters of support from both Sprint and AT&T that they could take two positions underneath us on the tower. Sprint has indicated they could use the 90-foot level, and <coughs> AT&T has said they could use the 80-foot level. So um, those, no one has filed any application, but um, <coughs> we kind of heard through the grapevine um, that they were looking in this area, um, and the tower would certainly be sufficiently strong to hold two different carriers uh, in addition to us, and those antennas would be um, mounted beneath us. This is the side view that shows the so-called monopine design. Um, there's basically a branch system that goes in place. Um, it would come down to about 40 feet of elevation and <clears throat> would be kind of extensive and robust enough to um, not only um, shield uh, Verizon's antennas at the top, but um, certainly the next two um, levels of antennas down if, if AT&T and Sprint follow through um, with their kind of suggested plan to co-locate here um, and additional, one additional tower, I mean one additional carrier on the tower. And so we had provided to, uh, as Jay noted, at the last meeting um, uh, we were asked to provide, I think it was called an apples to apples comparison. Show us what does the tower look like, what does the pine tree look like, and what would the so-called brown stick look like. And um, so we have modified the visual simulations that we had provided initially with the application. And you all have kind of two runs, um, one from the so-called plan A um, position, which is where we have proposed to construct the tower and as is shown on the site plans. And then we also asked the, um, the, the engineers to do a run of simulations uh, at a, a location slightly to the north east of where we've proposed, a little bit deeper in the trees, um, um, to see what the, the, what the difference would be in visual impacts um, for that slightly altered location. Now, you've got full sims that run through everything, and I can pull those up, but what I tried to do is pull out a few select viewpoints. Some of them had been identified by staff, really to show you the difference between kind of the lower tower or tree, which is at 100 feet, or the higher stick, and what the views might look like if you change the tower design. And then I also pulled out three of the viewpoints that showed differences in the visual impacts if we move the tower location, because I think those are two of the things you're looking at. What type of design should we have? Where should it be located? And should it be moved a little bit? And then at the very end, I'll come um, and wrap up with some comments about buffering and, and what trees are actually blocking the views of the tower um, and, and try so I can cover all three of those, um, uh, of those uh, topics. Um, one thing just to remind folks and, and to, uh, for the benefit of the new uh, planning board members, um, when we show the tower or the pine tree, that's at 100 feet. If we are showing the so-called brown stick, which is a tower in which the um, antennas are mounted inside the pole, that's shown at 120 feet, not 100 feet. And that's because you need to stack the antennas on top of each other to get the same coverage from the site. And as a result of not being able to put them on one array at one level, but stacking them, the tower needs to be taller. So when you see the sims and when you've gone through the sims, the, the brown stick is at, uh, is at a higher height uh, than the tower because it needs to be in order to accommodate the antennas. Um, the other issue to keep in mind when you're looking at the different design options is co-location. The uh, monopine or monopole at 100 feet 
is the simplest design for co-location because other carriers can come in on 10-foot increments and hang their antenna arrays um, on the tower as it's constructed. Um, the, the tower is strong enough to do it. It's a very simple process, and as all of you have seen as you've driven around Maine, this is the most common form of co-location, multiple antenna arrays on a single pole. When you do the brown stick, the benefit visually of the brown stick is you can't see any of the antennas. Um, and so there's much less mass to the structure, which is a benefit. The problem for co-location is that um, because you need essentially two 10-foot levels for each carrier, when you do another uh, carrier for co-location, instead of just needing a 10-foot spot, you need a 20-foot spot. Um, so it's much more difficult to do co-location on a brown <coughs> stick. Um, so you can't see the antennas, but it's not as uh, good for co-location. One of the goals of your ordinance is to try to encourage co-location, encourage carriers to construct towers that will accommodate future co-location um, so that towers don't have to get taller uh, and so that you don't need any more towers. Um, so that's kind of a trade-off as we go through the simulations with the stick. Um, and, and finally, from Verizon's perspective, um, the 100-foot pole, the 100-foot tree, or the 120-foot stick all work for Verizon's needs as far as meeting their coverage objectives at this site. So um, we propose a 100-foot tower because we think the visual impacts are, um, are less and that it's better for co-location. But at the end of the day, we can, with our um, agreement and our lease with the sanitary district, we could do the 100-foot tree, we could do the 120-foot stick. Either of those are options, and both of them work for Verizon. There's just some complications when you start adding other carriers to a brown stick that you don't have with the, with the pine tree or with the pole, um, just to keep that in mind. All right, so I think I'm just going to jump through a couple of the representative um, um, locations, and there are five for the pine tree versus stick. Um, so, and for each one, um, there's an arrow that points to the location where you can see the tower, um, and then uh, we will add the pine tree to that, and then we will add um, the, um, the brown stick. So this slide shows um, the, um, the monopole, and when you skip to the next one, it's easy to see when I go from the pole to the pine tree, we've added the branches on top, um, and so you see that there is, it's a darker as far as visual impacts, there's more mass there. Um, but, you know, if you came down uh, this road after this was constructed um, and you had no idea that this had ever happened, um, you know, there's a good chance that given the distances here that the monopine would blend in with the existing tree canopy, it's actually not as tall as some of the surrounding trees that are in the view shed of the viewer here. And so the benefit of the, of the mono pine is that it kind of blends in, um, whereas both the tower and the brown stick um, tend to stand out a little bit more. Um, and again, you can see the brown stick is a tiny bit taller than the mono pine um, because it has to be an additional 20 feet up in order to meet the coverage objectives. So then if we go, this is another um, a view from very far away. This is view six. Um, um, and this is the tower where the, the arrow is pointing. And when you add um, the monopine, you can see the, the uh, branch design kind of helps you show where the tower is. And then the third is the stick. So again, the big difference is the pine tree is a little denser and a little darker, and the stick is a little bit taller. And you have that trade-off. Um, the next, uh, I think this is the parking lot from Pine Point Beach. Um, again, that is the tower, which is not very easy to see, given the distance. Um, that is the, the pine tree. You can see it again kind of pop up along the tree line when we add the branches. And then that is the, the brown stick um, um, view from, from the parking lot there. So again, same kind of balancing issues. Uh, the pine tree is a little darker, um, but it really blends into the tree canopy and the... And the um, the, kind of the view that you have, and then the stick is a little bit taller, but not as dark and not as uh, voluminous at the top. And this is uh, looking uh, northeast. I think this is view eight. Um, again, the tower and the tree and the stick. So again, the difference between 
the monopine, and then the stick. And this is view 11, so this is looking <coughs> southwest a little bit closer than the others, and we get kind of a better view of, of the options. So that is the tower, and then that is the tree. You can see it pop up with the branches, and then that's the stick. So the big difference between the tower, the tree, and the stick is, I think, you know, that both the tower and the stick look man-made. There's no attempt to make it look like anything other than a man-made tower. So um, again, for folks that are going to pass these and see, see these um, and are not participating in this, or even if they are, they can't kind of remember exactly where it is, um, both the stick and, I mean, both the stick and the, the mono um, uh, tower will look man-made where you have the possibility with the monopine that from most of the distances it kind of blends into the tree canopy and is not quite as visual. All right, and then, um, and folks stop me at any point in time if you have questions, I'll just kind of keep barreling along, but please stop me if you have any questions. So then what, what I tried to do was pull together three different views it's numbers 10, 3, 10, and 11 in your packet um, to talk about the diff different visual impacts from the so-called location A and location B. Um, and before we get kind of run through, there's kind of multiple levels of trickiness for us. So um, if the board were to say, you know what, uh, pine tree, forget about it, terrifying, let's go with the brown stick. That's something that we can do under our, uh, the terms that we have with our lease right now with the sanitary district. We think that the, the, that the mono point is better, but at the end of the day, if you decided that the stick was preferable, we can do that under an existing <coughs> lease. Moving the um, location of the tower from location A to location B would require a lease amendment with the district. <clears throat> and just a little bit of background. After our last meeting, when we knew we were gonna come back to you with the apples to apples comparison of the multiple locations. Chip had approached the, the sanitary district to see if we could get them to amend the lease right then and there to give us the option of the two different locations. And the sanitary district has been great and the trustees met a couple times and they <coughs> thought about it. Um, the, the B location is a little deeper into the woods, requires a little more cutting, um, puts takes a little bit more of their property kind of off the table for any kind of future development or expansion. So it started to get to be something that, you know, was going to require some time and effort by the board. And they essentially said, okay, go show them your Sims, go back to the planning board, let the planning board make a decision. Um, and if they decide you've got to go to location B, um, then come back to us and we'll talk to you about a lease amendment. And then I kind of said to the sanitary district, well, can't really go to the planning board and talk about B because I don't have the right to go to B. So it, it was kind of a cart and a horse issue. But Jay weighed in and said, look, this, this is good enough for the, the planning board. Come to the board with the Sims. Let's take a look at the visual impacts of the different locations. Um, but if, again, if you were to decide that, that the location B is really preferable and has significant benefits, we don't have the right to do that now. Um, but we could approach the, the, the trustees and see if they would allow for a lease amendment to allow us to do that. If I could just sort of jump in on that point. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the reason why it made sense, you know, even if they didn't, you know, we, um, the sanitary district hasn't agreed to redo the lease, I also just point out that the ordinance explicitly states that the planning board has the authority um, to look at, uh, I'll, um, I don't have the language right in front of me, I can pull it out, but basically alternate locations on the property if you find that it, that an alternate location does a better job for buffering and the visual impacts. Um, so we also have an email from the director um, where he attached minutes from the sanitary district board that essentially said exactly what was just stated, that though the board hasn't agreed to redo the lease, that if the board, if this board finds that alternative location B is set, you know, it's, it's what's needed, they will um, consider that you know, and probably redo the lease. But again, that's really sort of a private uh, arrangement between the applicant and the property owner. This board's job, this charge is to review the standards and, um, and find that they meet those standards sort of regardless of that private agreement. Um, and whatever sort of happens after this board's decision is, again, that would be a private arrangement mm -hmm. between those two property, uh, parties. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And then the one thing that's kind of 
tricky, and, and I don't know that the board has a lot of guidance on this, is um, at what, kind of, what would it take to get the board to say, all right, look, it's, it, you've proposed it over here, you don't have the right to move it over here, but we think it's better. Kind of what's the threshold? That our, our, um, again, for Verizon, either of these locations work perfectly well for us, regardless of the type of the tower or where it goes. They're relatively close together, and so um, uh, both of these locations would work. We just, we just can't tell you for certain that we'd be able to get the, um, the trustees to agree to a change in the location, but we would certainly try if you went there. So let's kind of jump into the, to, to the, to the slides. I pulled again three out that I think show um, the difference um, and, the, and the visual impacts based on the location change. So this is um, showing the mono tower, and this is location A. This is the proposed location. And if we switch it and we move the tower over to location B, you can see the difference in some of the buffering on the tower. Um, and so it is certainly the case, and I think staff noted this, that when you go to the, the B location, uh, there is some higher vegetation that uh, blocks a little bit more of the tower. It looks like it's maybe 10 feet more of the tower is blocked. No matter what you do, you still will see the bulk of the top of the tower because at this um, uh, visual location, we're getting closer to the tower um, and we're starting to look at vegetation that's closer in proximity to where the tower is. And obviously we're talking about a 100 foot tower. These trees are 45 to 65 feet in height. So you're gonna see the top of the tower when you start to get this close. And um, you know, the question I think for the board is, um, you know, how much of an improvement is it to move it from there, which is where we propose it, to there. The other thing um, to point out, and this will come out in some of the later slides, is when we put this in the um, plan A location right here, and, and as you recall, we, we raised a crane the day we did the simulations so that the engineers could see where the top of the tower would be. And then we send them out driving around to, see, to try to find locations where you can see the tower. And then what they do is when they get into an area like this, they move themselves back and forth so they find the worst possible view of the crane. Because what they want to represent is it's visible from this area. Here is the worst location and the worst view where you can see the, the greatest amount of the tower. Because we don't want to come to you with a sim in which they kind of moved over a little bit, snuck behind a tree and made it look better than it was. So um, the challenge with looking at a simulation for an alternative location is that when you move the tower from this A location to the B, right standing here, more of that tower is blocked. But if you moved to the right, and we had told the engineers back in the beginning, hey, we're gonna do option B, so go show us the worst possible photo of that tower at option B. If you moved kind of to the right of this photo, it may change actually that last 10 feet, whether it really is covered by the vegetation, because again, this is only a simulation in one, from one spot, and we can't really show you a, a kind of, can you hear me now, move 10 feet down the road and take a million pictures and show you how it changes. But as the vegetation moves, um, the, the, the actual location of the site in relation to that vegetation can kind of change what you see. So those are the two of the tower. This is the two of the monopine. There is the monopine in location A, and there is the monopine in location B. Again, same kind of thing. A little bit more of the tower is, um, is kind of covered in, in location B uh, from this perspective. And then here is the brown stick, both at location A and location B. Now, going back to the stick versus pine tree thing, you know, from a lot of the other places where the tower can be seen, it's very, very far away, and the slides, it's really hard to see what, how different it's gonna look. But this, this viewpoint does a pretty good job of, of showing you the difference between the stick and the monopine. You know, the question is if you're you know, comparing apples to apples with A, is the visual impact of the tree um, with the stick. At this location, the stick is 20 feet taller and that's significant. It's also clearly man-made. And so again, if you know, if you had no idea that this was happening and you were walking your dog here a year from now and you looked over, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff. You're gonna see the house, you're gonna see the wastewater treatment plant, and maybe you see this and say, oh my God, that's a horrible 
cell phone tower disguised as a pine tree. But it, it may also look like a pine tree and not draw your eye, whereas the stick is taller. It's clearly man-made. Um, and this view shed um, uh, series kind of really gives you a good sense of the difference between the two. Again, having said that, we can do either one, and it works for Verizon. So th that one's entirely up to the board. Um, again, that's the stick at, at position P. All right, so now we're moving around to view three. This was the other one where the staff had said, hey, it looks a little better from B than from A here, so let's take a look at this. So there's the tower at location A, and that's the tower at location B. And now what you can see is that there is a kind of a high clump of trees where when you move it from A to B, the tower disappears behind that, that, that clump. So again, from this perspective, when we tried to take the worst view of location A, we caught it right in between that little dip in the tree canopy, which is where you could see it. So that's why they set up here with a photograph to take the location A picture. When you move to location B from here, yeah, it looks better. But if you move, the viewer moves to the left, what you're going to do is you're going to come to another saddle, another low point between some of these high um, canopy crowns. And then, at that point in time, the B location, you might be looking at it in a low spot while the A location is, is behind a taller tree. And so it is the case from right here, you know, A and B, and you can see it with the pine trees too. There's the A location and there's the B location. Um, but as you move right and left, it may actually swap and the A's might get better than the B's and vice versa. Um, this is, and then you can see that here's the brown stick again from A and B. Again, from both of those, it, it's a little bit taller, so it's a little different. So here is view 11. So the staff had noted, hey, at view 11, B might be worse than A, so we might want to stick with A. Um, again, this is um, to the north, so when you move the tower from the A location to the B location, it gets closer to the viewer, and as a result, everything gets bigger. So that is, I think I just did the pine tree and the, uh, the stick here. So there's the pine tree at the A location, and there's the pine tree in the B location. And there's the stick in the A location, and there's the stick in the B location. So this is a good example of one spot where when you move it from point A right there to point B, the visual impacts actually go up regardless of the design. Um, and this is largely because when you look at the point A and B locations, and let me just pop these up, um, this slide kind of shows an overhead of the sanitary district site. The, the marsh is obviously up to the left. Um, the views kind of run as a crown from the upper left to the upper right, looking down towards the site. And you can see with the red arrows, we have the location of the tower at option A identified and the location of the tower at option B identified. And, um, and so that distance kind of in the big universe is not a huge move. Um, it's significant on the site because it's outside of our lease area. But when you start to get 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet away, um, moving the tower that small amount doesn't have a significant difference. And, and it's because if you look at the trees around the option B and option A site, those are not the trees that are blocking your view of the tower. From view 10, which was one across the, the, um, um, the marsh, you can see we've kind of drawn a, a red line in here which marks the rough edge of the shoreland zoning boundary. So all of the vegetation um, above that red line is within shoreland zoning and there are significant cutting restrictions as you know already on that vegetation. And those are the trees that are blocking your views from that subdivision across the marsh. It's, now, every once in a while, depending where you move, you might see through some of those trees on the marsh, and maybe one of the ones back closer to the tower would block some of the view. But both tower locations are significantly away from the marsh, and it's really the vegetation um, immediately along the marsh that's doing the blocking. And then when you look kind of to the upper right, that's looking up towards views 3 and 11 that we looked at the end. A lot of that vegetation is actually on the Sprague property. And when we were looking at these crowns, kind of on this view, that vegetation is not on the sanitary district property. A lot of that's on the Sprague property. It's closer to the viewer. And so it's the vegetation in, in these kind of outer areas away from the tower site 
that are actually doing most of the buffering when you're looking at the tower close by. Of course, when you're over at Pine Point, you're looking from there, it's, it's the trees well off this site that are doing the buffering, um, which is why you can kind of see a change when we move uh, from A to B, but the change is not significant. So, so when it comes to tower design, we've tried to show you kind of what the stick looks like vis-a-vis -vis the others. Um, with regard to location, we've tried to show simulations at both the option A and option B location, and it's a hit or miss. At some places, it's a little bit better. At other places, it's not as good to move it to option B. Um, and again, we could explore that with the district, but we don't have the rights to do that. The, the final has to do with the buffering, and as Jay mentioned, you should be looking at whether to require the retention of any um, uh, vegetation on site to make sure that whatever kind of buffering we're showing you out there will last and doesn't go away if we come in and do any more cutting. What we've tried to convey is that the vegetation immediately near these, um, where the tower impoundments would be here, is not the most important vegetation in providing buffering. It's the stuff that's a little bit farther away, and a lot of it is off-site. Um, I think it is helpful to note that a lot of the vegetation that blocks the view of the tower from the marsh is within shoreland zoning. There are already significant cutting restrictions uh, on that vegetation, and there's not likely to be any expansion of the sanitary district site in that direction because it starts to violate setbacks and the like. So a lot of that vegetation is already protected and retained under your existing code, um, and, um, and so we don't think you get a lot of bang for the buck in you know, restricting cutting 25 feet away from the tower compound because, again, those are not the trees that actually block the view of the site. Also, in the hierarchy of tricky, um, um, the um, brown stick, piece of cake. We can do that under our existing lease. Make us go to um, option B. We'll do our best. I'm kind of cautiously optimistic that we could figure that one out. I just don't know what gets us much benefit, um, really. Significant cutting restrictions around the, the base of the tower. You know, we've got a 75 by 75 foot area. I think Ivan years ago had noted, hey, most of these are 100 by 100. So that's the kind of area that most carriers lock up with a lease. To do a, a significant amount of additional no cutting near the base of the tower would be tricky because it then really starts to interfere with the remaining developable land for the sanitary district and whether they need a new parking area or a new expansion of the facilities. That becomes that will just become more difficult for us to negotiate. We would try, and we would give it the old college try to do that, but um, when I <clears throat> kind of look into the future, I think that the tower design is wide open and it could be whatever you want. Moving the location is a little trickier, um, but probably could be done. Lots of additional cutting restrictions around the base of the tower are likely to be a challenge. That doesn't mean that you guys won't look at all this and say, hey, tough Scott, you know, that's why you get paid the big bucks. Go make it happen. We think X, Y, and Z, you, you shouldn't be able to cut here, there, and everywhere. But what we've tried to show, I think, is that you don't get a lot for restricting the cutting at the immediate base of the tower. It's the other vegetation that's doing a lot of the blocking. Um, and that's the way it is for many macro sites that, that we work on in the state of Maine. So I think that is all I have for slides. But um, obviously, we just kind of hit bits and pieces of it. If um, And you're looking kind of globally at all standards. So we're here to answer any questions that you may have about any of the standards that you're reviewing. Um, we're also here, of course, to listen to any public comment and try to give you our thoughts based on that. Um, and so um, please let us know what is helpful at this point in time. Thanks, Scott, for the presentation. Appreciate sure. that. Uh, we are, um, the next step in this is a public comment section. We are approaching on two and a half hours. So I'm going to beg a five minute recess of you all so we can relieve ourselves and take a breath before we jump into the fun part of the evening. Thank you.
Robert here. Um, so before we jump into public comment, which is the next item, I do want to say that uh, we, we have received a lot of public comment. This is all of the information we've received from the public so far in writing. So um, I, I will ask that you do limit your comments to a couple minutes. There are a lot of you here that wish to speak this evening. Um, and I also think it's really important for you as the public, um, you come out here and why, why are you here? Why are you trying to talk to us? It's because you have opinions and you want to help influence this process, you want to help influence the project. What's the best way you guys can do that? And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's, it's limiting it to what it is we're discussing this evening. So under, have a full understanding of what it is we as board members need for information. Um, and the really, the big questions that we're trying to answer this evening is one, which location? Is it location A or location B? All right, and we had a brief overview there of location A is their original proposal. Location B is how many feet down the road? Maybe 50 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. Another 40, 50 feet into the woods, further. So this board is going to be considering location A or location B. Help us get feedback on your, your thoughts on that. The other thing that we're going to be looking at that this board needs to be considering this evening is the type of poll. All right, so if you want to provide us feedback this evening, this is a great opportunity to talk to us about the type of pole, whether it's uh, the regular monopole, whether it's a monopine, or whether it's that brown stick. There's three options in front of this board. Those are the topics that we really need to be uh, looking at this evening. Um, there is not going to be a motion this evening um, to send this uh, for approval. That's, that's going to um, happen, hopefully, at a different meeting. Um, what we really need to do here is give these applicants our feedback. They're going to put their best proposal forward, and when that proposal comes back to us, that's when the appropriate time for a motion would be. At that time, that motion, we intend to make completely public. Everyone will have a copy of it beforehand. You will see what the outlined findings of these hearings have been. So multiple hearings that we've gone through, a lot of you have been here with us through this, You'll be able to see the information, the findings. You'll also be able to see any conditions that this board has prepared. Um, at that time is when, and this is in a future meeting, this is not tonight, that time is when this board is really going to sit down and say, yes, I'm in favor of this because it does meet this criteria, or no, we are opposed to this because it fails to meet this type of criteria. That's when you're really going to get an answer out of us. So tonight, really try to focus on helping us get to that next application level. What is it you as the public, if you had to see something, if it did go through, what is it we are really looking at? And that's going to help us steer this discussion. It's going to help the applicant, helps us get to that next step, and then hopefully to some sort of finality to this, this process. So appreciate your cooperation on that. And again, if, if you could keep your comments to a couple minutes, there are a lot of you here this evening. Really greatly appreciate it. When you approach, please give your name in your discussion, um, and I will interject if I feel like you've been getting off course, um, if, you're, if you're really kind of eating, eating up a little too much time, and it's not because I don't like you, and it's not because I don't want to hear from you, but we do have to keep uh, an order of business to this, okay? Appreciate it, everyone. Do the lights come on and off when, when your time runs up? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I, I have the official watch here. Okay, good. <laughs> I can promise you I can't do it in two minutes. I can do it in five minutes, if that's okay. We can meet in the middle at four. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> Just stop me. Okay. All right. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name's Marvin Gates. I live at 423 Black Point Road here in Scarborough. Uh, I'm a resident. Uh, your description, thank you very much. Uh, I do think that the pole design and the location and the height uh, are the questions, obviously, pull design and location. I've prepared my remarks, and I'll be quick. For reasons having to do with both buffering and visual impact, which have a tremendous impact on the pole and location, buffering and visual impact standards, you ask the applicant for photo sim simulations from roadways only. Why did you not ask the applicant for simulations from public spaces and budding properties? The Scarborough Marsh, for example, is both an abutting property and a public space. Section 9F2C2 mentions that towers shall be buffered 
uh, have a dense tree growth around them that minimizes the visual impact from abutting properties and public spaces. Also, Section 9F2D authorizes you to require Verizon to submit simulations from abutting properties and public spaces. Therefore, again, why didn't you require the applicant to submit simulations from the Scarborough Marsh? Instead of wondering about this, though, will you require the applicant now to provide those simulations, please? And on the sub subject of simulations, Please notice that 20 of those that were submitted by Verizon for this meeting are non-complying renderings. The 20 incorrectly presented simulations are comprised all of those, they're all of the ones that are of the concealment tower, what has been referred to as the brown stick. Um, they are painted a dark brown. Why? The zoning ordinance very clearly talks about painting the tower quote, in a sky tone above the top of surrounding trees. That's section 9F2E. Since there is no other choice in paint color that the ordinance talks about, again, why did the applicant simulate it painted brown? Brown is very visible. Uh, a sky tone is not. Instead of wondering about this further, though, will you require, please, Verizon to submit conforming simulations? Regarding the height, The zoning ordinance section 9F2A1 height and section 9F2G co-location are clear and they do not prevent the planning board from requiring Verizon to locate on their proposed tower at the lowest possible elevation that satisfies Verizon's RF requirements. Verizon proposes to locate the center of their antennas at the 95 foot elevation with spaces for other providers antennas at center elevations of 85 feet, 75, and 65 feet. Verizon has claimed that AT&T and Sprint can co-locate on the tower at those lower elevations. Can Verizon? Have you asked to see the report that demonstrates that they cannot? The zoning ordinance authorizes future co-location applicants to increase the tower's height and co-locate antennas above the existing antennas. Have you considered this option? If so, why has it not been brought up to the public's attention at your meetings? And if not, before you vote on whether or not Verizon has met the zoning ordinance's height standards, will you please have the town's attorney look more closely at this option and consider it? Meaning, build a tower that goes in at 75 or 85 feet height centered antennas, and then if somebody comes after, raise it as the zoning ordinance authorizes that to happen. And what is true for what I refer to as the standard built tower heights is true for the concealment tower height too. Only the shapes and the sizes, as was pointed out of the standard built tower, uh, excuse me, only the shapes and sizes of the antennas are different. Ivan Pagosik at IDK Communications reviewed Verizon's C squared systems RF report and estimated that Verizon should be able to satisfy their RF engineering requirements within a 90-foot concealment tower. Will you please require Verizon to submit the technical data to substantiate, refute, or refute IDK's estimate? Thank you very much. Thank you. And as um, our, our last speaker has just demonstrated, questions should be directed through the chair for anyone that wasn't aware of it. Um, and then we will, as a board, either take up those questions and ask the applicant. But thank you for knowing that. You've been around a little bit. Anyone else like to speak on this? Hi, my name is uh, Cynthia Taylor, and I live at 441 Black Point Road. Uh, this is well within the viewshed of my home, and I feel very strongly about it. I'd like to uh, support everything that Marvin Gates has said. And I would like to invite all of you to come down to Black Point Road and look directly from the State Park, one of our best monuments we have in our community, and see how prevalent this location is really going to be. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Nina McKee, and I live at 309 Black Point Road. 
Um, I think you're all incredibly wonderful. I don't know how you stand doing this, frankly. <laughs> anyway, I'm here because I'm reading a letter from Lucy and Bill Lacase, who were, were not able to be here tonight. And they asked me to read their letter. And this is it. Dear Jay, Jamel, and the members of the planning board, the future of our town's most prized resource, the Scarborough Marsh, will be in your hands this Monday evening. We urge you to stand strong and to not allow the desecration of this highly valued public space. Do not be swayed by Verizon's corporate tenacity. Listen to your own constitu constituents, the voice of our town. Scarborough residents place tremendous value on the Scarborough Marsh. It is a, our brand and our identity. Please do not sully its splendor with all with ill-placed industrial mon mon monstrosities. The planning board has the authority to designate the, designate the location and the design of a Verizon's proposed tower. We urge you to exercise that authority. We urge you to only approve a cryptically colored stealth tower with interne internally embedded antennae, what Verizon calls a brown stick, and to only approve that tower for Site B, which has improved buffering over Site A. As stated in the zoning ordinance, quote, Within the transmission tower overlay district, all transmission towers shall be surrounded, surrounded by a buffer of, an, of dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual <coughs> impact from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. End of quote. The Scarborough Mars is a widely used and highly valued public space, and for Verizon's originally proposed Site A, there is no buffer of dense tree growth or vegetation to screen the proposed tower from that prized public space. The lack of buffering at Site A is evident it's evidence in the photo um, which was taken from the marsh, and that's pretty horrific when you look at it. Um, <clears throat> Verizon is arguing that the view of the tower would be the same from both sites. We disagree. There are only considering they are only considering the view of the lower of the tower the view of the tower above the tree canopy from great distances, Pine Point, etc. They are not considering the tower's impact from the perspective of the many Scarborough residents who re recreate on the Scarborough Marsh and its waterways. And, and who would be able to see the tower in its in entirety at Site A. And you can just see that in the photo. Additionally, any external antennae, whether poorly disguised as a tree or left exposed, would be a tremendous eyesore from the Scarborough Marsh. In fact, at the March 12, 2018 meeting with the planning board, Verizon's representative, Chip Fredette, stated that the edge of the Scarborough Marsh is not a good location for a monopine. Quote, in some cases, the monopine has its place. Oh, please. OK, well, I'll, I'll skip that quote. I'll get two minutes. Um, it is indeed up to the board to decide, and neither a monopole or a monopine is the way to go. The views from the Scarborough Marsh of either a monopoint or monopole would absolutely be too obvious. The planning board should stipulate that a cryptically painted stealth, stealth tower brown, brown below the tree line and neutral sky above with internal antennae is the only acceptable design for a tower at, the, at this aesthetically sensitive location. The height should also be kept to the absolute minimum. We urge you, our town planners, to only approve a cryptically colored stealth tower with internally embedded antennae and to only approve that tower for Site B, which has improved buffering over Site A. Please listen to the people Thank are you. saying. Please do we not. also have the written copy here, so okay. um, I appreciate it. That helps well, people at home. Thank you. I, it was you, my mission. It was I, my and mission. And you, you served well. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll say this. You hit on the points. You, you, you've given us a, a site location and a, and a, a, a style, so we yeah, appreciate and that's that. that's really important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
My name is Stephanie Smith. I live at Audubon Way in Scarborough, and I'm president of the board of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. I'm going to be very brief, and I will basically support what Lucy and Bill have, have said to the effect that Site B takes the, takes the tower, whichever, whichever design we use, farther away from the marsh and puts it in a more heavily forested area. So we really recommend Site B. The idea of the, quote, brown stick, painted so that it is, is a darker color below the tree line and a, a neutral bluish color above the tree line where it would blend in a little, little would not be quite <coughs> as obvious, is, is our preference <coughs> in terms of what we do. Um, let's see, so site, tower, <coughs> is there something else? You got it all. That's it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Don Hamill. Uh, uh, I am a resident of Pine Point, uh, and I would agree with what I saw in the photos. You definitely cannot see anything from those photos from Pine Point, from the vantage point. Uh, you can't see, you know, any of those, any of those options that were presented. Uh, I should also add. I'm speaking. Uh, I am a member of the town council in Scarborough, uh, and I am also a, a liaison to the, to the planning board. But I'm speaking tonight as a, as a citizen, as a resident, and someone who has tracked this uh, issue very closely over, many months. Uh, so I want to thank the residents who've been very vocal and persistent in their efforts to try to push this. Uh, despite some very disappointing uh, meetings. Uh, and I recall in particular the one about the priority of location, which was particularly painful, in which there was a, a big discussion about possible locations that ranged from something that sounded like it was out of a Stephen King novel. You know, the, the options were the uh, top of the congregational church, the top of a fire station at Black Point, and the cupola of the Black Point Inn. So, I mean, I... So I'm pleased that we're reaching the point now where it's starting to make more sense. And, and actually, I, I want to uh, also thank the planning board for their patience and uh, their fortitude in hearing this thoroughly. And also, I want to uh, uh, pay a, a small tribute to Scott Anderson and as he represents Verizon, not an easy <coughs> task. But actually, we're getting to a point now where it looks like there is an answer here, that, that something that actually makes sense from using the standard of common sense, uh, you know, may actually come in, into play and may actually be the, the final result. So uh, I, you heard what the preferences are. I, I think there's not as big a turnout here this evening as there have been at many prior meetings, um, but it's quite clear the residents have voiced this uh, consistently. Uh, the be better buffered location, and also the monopole that's disguised uh, with paint as described up to the tree line brown and then above that gray or blue. So, uh, and I, you know, it was uh, good to hear Verizon say we'd accept either one location, we would, we would accept either uh, type of pole. So I, this really comes to the board for a decision and it's well within the board's authority and ability to uh, align with the preference of the public and also something that's acceptable from a technical standpoint. So I would hope that we would follow through on that and uh, there will continue to be a lot of attention and focus on, on this and uh, um, uh, let's hope for an, an outcome uh, that is commonsensical and also practical. Thank you. My name is Diana Hammond, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Prouts Neck Audubon Society. Uh, I wanted to reiterate our concerns about the cell tower being proposed on the sanitary district property abutting the Scarborough Marsh. Uh, we gather that the town and Verizon will go ahead with this tower, despite the voice concerns of many individuals who oppose its installation. The Prout Snack Audubon Society joins these voices in <coughs> emphasizing the need to preserve the integrity of the town's precious saltwater marsh resource and to protect its environmental habitat. As you are aware, the Scarborough Marsh is a critical feeding ground for many breeding and migratory shorebirds, 
some of which are threatened and endangered species. The Prowseneck Audubon Society, in conjunction with National Audubon and the Seabird Restoration Program, have spent over 30 years improving the nesting habitat, habitat for these birds on nearby <coughs> Stratton Island. Most of these birds, including the endangered roseate and Lee's terns, rely on the Scarborough Marsh for food. The design choice and location of this proposed cell tower structure is critical to the continued safety of these birds. A singly cryptically painted pole, excuse me, a single cryptically painted pole with no external antennae situated as far away from the marsh as possible would cause the least harm to these migratory and feeding birds. Please consider the continued preservation of these threatened species in making your selection of the cell tower structure and placement. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm an attorney at Jensen Barrett Gardner and Henry. I'm here tonight representing the Prout's Neck Association. Um, like everyone else, I want to thank the board. You've heard from us many times uh, over the course of review of this project, and I am just going to focus on two provisions of the ordinance tonight. The first is section 9F2C2, and that is the, uh, the buffering provision of the transmission tower overlay. It requires that there be a dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impact from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. It is our opinion, and it is based in part upon the simulations that we provided to you many months ago, that option A cannot meet this standard. You can see the um, whatever design of pole you have underneath the tree line, it's all going to look the same, and you can see through the trees uh, from the marsh and several other locations as we showed you in our simulation. So we do not believe that option A can meet that standard. We do think option B probably can meet the standard. Um, and so for that reason, if this board is going to approve a tower on this site, as we think is probably going to happen, we urge you to require that it be relocated to option B. And we certainly have heard, many, many of our members have attended um, sanitary district meetings. We have heard clearly that the district is more than willing to work with Verizon. Um, it wants to know where it's going to go. It needs to have some more information about, about cutting, but it, it clearly is in favor of working with Verizon to resolve these issues. And so we think that that is an easy fix to just go back to the district with the proposed location um, and to negotiate the terms. And we hope that the board will require that to be done. Otherwise, we don't believe that you can approve this because it doesn't meet that standard. The second standard that I want to talk about has been discussed at great length by other people, which is section 9F2E. And this is the section that allows this board to determine the type of monopole that will be allowed. Of course, your ordinance only allows a monopole, but there are three forms that can take. One is the traditional monopole. One is um, a stealth tower exhibiting concealed <coughs> antennas. That's the term in your ordinance. It's also been referred to as a brown stick. It's been referred to as a flagpole. But you know what it is. It's the one that has the <laughs> antennas inside. And the third option is a different type of what's called a stealth tower, but it's, it's actually the monopine. We think in this particular location, the monopine is not a good resolution because it will be, it, it's going to be visible above the tree line. Anything is going to be visible above the tree line, but we don't think that the pine, the monopine, blends well into the other vegetation. It's going to, it's going to stick out, and as we've discussed at prior board meetings, under federal law, this tower can go up as a matter of right 20 additional feet, up to 20 additional feet. If it goes up 20 additional feet, Think about what that visual impact is going to be on the marsh if that pine is 20 feet higher. You may think that it looks okay when it's close to the top of the tree line, but I think if you look at it again, you will not think it's okay if it's 20 feet 
higher than that, so substantially above the tree line. We appreciate that Verizon initially thought and the town thought that maybe this was a good solution, but when you think about what can happen as of right with this tower, we don't think that you can approve a monopine in this location. And certainly I don't think anybody's proposing the monopole, which has a lot of the same issues as the monopine. So as everybody has said tonight, we really would, would urge the board to require the internally concealed type of, of tower on this location. Um, PNA asked me, because we think this might be the last chance we get to speak to you on this issue, that I be very clear with you. Our first preference is no tower on this site. We don't think that's a realistic result because the zoning ordinance allows a tower on this site. So we ask that this board be vigilant in requiring the best possible location and the best possible design. In fact, if you do approve this at, in the option B location and if you do approve it as the internally concealed antennas, Prout Snack Association has authorized me to tell you that it will not appeal that decision. If you do not require those things, it will appeal the decision. This isn't a threat. We just want you to understand where we're coming from on this and how important it is to the membership of the association <coughs> that this be done in a manner that has the least possible impact on, on the area. So in closing, we ask you to exercise the authority that the ordinance gives to you to require the location, to <coughs> require that it be the internally mounted antennas. We ask that you do this for the good of the marsh, for the good of the citizens of, of the town of Scarborough, and for the good of everyone who's going to look at this tower for many decades to come. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak this evening? My name is Ann Hancock. I live on Old Neck Road in Scarborough. I'm just going to read a letter that I wrote to you earlier um, to the planning board. As the planning board reviews the latest iteration of Verizon's plan to construct a cell tower near the Scarborough Marsh, we hope you will hear the voices of all who have urged you to preserve the character <coughs> and beauty of this astonishing ecosystem. The salt marsh invokes strong feelings because it's, it is the defining landscape of our town. Few places in Maine are privileged to have salt marshes within their borders. And there is no larger area of contiguous salt marsh in our state. If we must accept this tower, it is critical that the planning board takes care with the placement and physical construction of this unwanted addition. With the above in mind, we would strongly urge the planning board to insist on the following conditions for the proposed Verizon Tower. <clears throat> Please stipulate that the tower be situated on Site B, the more heavily vegetated portion of Scarborough Sanitary District property. This will somewhat mitigate the hazards it, it poses to wildlife. Please reference the IFS IFWS report submitted in the first meeting, which enumerated all the reasons not to place communication towers near wetlands, migratory bird corridors, and areas where endangered species feed and nest. All of these should have stopped this project in the first place. Secondly, please mandate that the tower be constructed as a brown stick with no external antennae. Further, if Verizon adopts a paint scheme to camouflage the pole, this will help mitigate its visual impact. Thirdly, the board should also definitely maintain mandate a height cap on the project at the minimum necessary for tower operation. We hope the planning board will help us as we seek to reduce the aesthetic and environmental damage that this unwelcome tower will do to our beautiful marsh. Thank you. Does anyone else like to speak this evening? And with that, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, thank you all for sharing your thoughts and helping us out as we uh, work through this. So, first off, how are you feeling tonight, Rachel? I'm up? feeling just fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Would you like to start us off? Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, and I really appreciate the, uh, uh, all of the public really sticking with us through this whole process. Uh, if, um, if Rocky's Crossroad Development uh, had the largest binder that has come before me since I've been on, on this board for the last three years, uh, you folks have generated the most public comment. Uh, and it's been a consistent comment, it's been a thoughtful comment, and I appreciate, I appreciate that work. Uh, it's what helps us do our job here uh, when we hear from you. And we hear from you in a very thoughtful, uh, deliberate way. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I have a question around the buffering. Uh, and you've talked about the trees and the trees in the distance. But um, there's also the buffering that's close by because people driving by on the road or people in a kayak in the marsh a lot closer, uh, they're looking at the base of the tower, not so much the height of the tower. So what sort of buffering do you folks really have planned for the base of that tower? Jamal, can I steal the system from you? Sure. Um, I don't know how to do that. I, I think your thing is still up. I, I think if I, you plug in, it'll plug just go to you. I'll, I'll bounce you. All right. Uh -huh. You are correct. All right, let me see if I can give it a second. It should pop up. I have another question while we're waiting for the technology to work. <laughs> All right, shoot, I'll try to answer and plug at the same time. <laughs> okay, um, this ta the monopole is 20 feet above, it's gonna be 120 feet, correct? The monopole would be 100. Uh, the stealth, I'm sorry, the stealth, would the, the brown stick. That's right, it would be 120 feet. Okay, um, and I don't immediately have the code in front of me, but, um, if it's possible to build a 20% or add on 20% height, well, theoretically, uh, in the future, that, is that correct that that would also be true for the brown stick as it is, let's say, for the monopine? It would, yeah. So it would be at, at a 24-foot addition. No, yeah, so I think the town attorney had arced in. So the way the, this federal law works, the Spectrum Act, you can go up 10%. Um, what is it, 20%? 20%. 20% or, or 20 feet, whatever is greater. So um, at a 120 foot tower, someone could add a 20 foot Four. section on top. Um, no, I 24 think, foot yeah, section. I think it might be the lower of the two. Is it lower or the higher? It, yeah. We, yeah. We have the comment from our town attorneys. 10% or 20 feet. Whichever is greater. Whichever is greater. So okay. the maximum would be 20 feet. So um, the 120 could be extended to 140. Okay. And I'm still, and I'd like to show you. There you go. Look at that. All right, excellent. Um, so let me, um, let me just go to the answering your second question. Mm -hmm. Let me just pull up view 10 because I think this one. So there is, um, so there is the, the stick. Um, this one is the view across the marsh from the development on the other side that's the closest. And so whether you're at the location A or the location B, that's the stick at 120 feet. Um, so that could go up an additional 20 feet um, um, under this federal provision. Um, um, this was, I mean, and, and again, we come back to either one of these design works, but um, the one that we're showing here, or again, whichever location it's at, A or B, is 100 feet, and we have a notice from two other carriers that they can go beneath the tower. Given that U.S. Cell is at the Black Point fire, you have four of the five carriers operating in Maine um, that are either already here or could go on the 100 foot or below. Um, we've, we've made all kinds of great legal arguments in our submittals about the fact that we don't know who's coming down the pike and where they might go, and therefore you can't really look at 140 or 120 or anything that might be based on speculative 
future applications, but at least for the design that we've proposed, we have heard from two of the carriers that they can go beneath us, which suggests that if you went with the pine tree or the monopole, that it is unlikely that anybody would try to exercise those rights under federal law to go up. But of course, I, I, I don't know. You know you, and we don't know. We don't know what would happen. So. But uh, with the, uh, the brown stick, they can fit inside at the 120? They can. And again, Verizon is... They it, could. They could. <laughs> Verizon is fine with doing the stick, and I appreciate that at some point this becomes subjective. What, what do you think looks better? We have a, a significant group of people that have been spending a lot of time providing you with comment, and I think universally we're hearing from them that the taller stick, although taller, is preferable because the antennas are inside. <clears throat> and at 120 feet, that works perfectly well for Verizon. We can do that tomorrow. Um, I, I just want to make sure the board understands that, I mean, even as Ivan identified in the comments that he submitted to the board, it's trickier to do co-location with a, with a stick because you've got to fit all the antennas inside. And um, if that is the case, then there's a risk that someone could come in and try to go higher. That risk is probably smaller if you use a, a pine tree or, or a pole. But again, you, totally your call. We can, we can work with either one. Um, and I should, go, I should go back to your first question. Go, correct, the buffering immediately around, yeah. especially site, site B. All right, so let me just get to the last slide. Which, okay, so this is the, 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 the shot from above that shows the sewer district uh, property, the vegetation on site, and the locations of options A and B. Um, and I think part of the reason why a lot of the commentators like the option B is because you can see when you move from A to B, it goes slightly deeper into the woods on the site for the sanitary district. Our view, though, is that that vegetation in the immediate vicinity of those two areas identified as A and B, that's not actually the vegetation that blocks the views, even when you're in the marsh. So as you can see, there's significant vegetation between the wastewater treatment plant and the marsh and along the edge that, is, um, that blocks the view, a, a portion of the tower. As you saw from the simulations, the top still sticks up when you're that close, and there's no way um, to completely shield the tower, but um, the, the, you know, the, the, the viewpoints from the road, which is not very close to where the site is, there's not a lot of residential development near the site, or actually, other than the golf course, there, there aren't homes or subdivisions near this area, so um, we think if you're kind of thinking about the areas around the marsh, it's the vegetation along the edge of the marsh that's doing most of the buffering. I, I believe there was at least one letter, if not more, that, that indicated a, a concern about uh, the visibility from cars driving by or from the abutters, and that's one of the reasons I'm asking this question, what you're yeah, looking at me, in terms of some additional buffering around the base of the tower. Yeah, and let me just see if I can, um, in the simulations that we did, um, let's see if I can blow this up. I can blow it up. So. Um, um, if you take a look here um, on the screen, you'll see the star, which is located where the tower site is, and the red line going by, of course, is, is um, uh, Black Point Road. And so one of the things that, that the engineers did is they drove all the roads around, and so when you're going by the site, given the distance between where the star is located and Black Point Road, you actually can't see the tower from anywhere on Black Point Road as you're driving by. So when the crane was up at 100 feet at that tower A, and it would largely be the same if the tower was at location B, um, you can't see it from Black Point Road because of the, the vegetation. Really, the vegetation within the first 25 or 50 feet of Black Point Road, because when you're at that level and you're going past the site and you're looking in towards the site, again, it's those trees right there on the road that would block the view of the tower. It's not the trees kind of up and over the canopy immediately in, uh, adjacent um, to the tower that are providing that buffering. And look, theoretically, you could say, you've got a 25-acre site. I don't want you to cut a single tree on the 25-acre site. It's hard to find these big sites because there aren't a lot of them. We found one. Um, putting significant development, I mean, cutting restrictions is a power and a tool that you have. We're, that's, that's kind of a big one, though, and we would want to make sure that you are comfortable and confident that 
if you put any significant cutting restrictions on, that it would actually have an effect. And what we're trying to, to convey respectfully is that it, it's those trees right along the road or those trees up near viewpoint three or up near viewpoint 11 where the viewer is standing or driving that blocks the view of the tower. It's not those trees within like the 50 or 75 feet around the base and therefore cutting restrictions in that area normally don't work. So you're not intending to put in any additional buffering around the base of the tower? Is that well, right the way now, I take it? Yeah, right now, well, right now we don't even have the right to go to position B, but what we're saying is that um, when you take a look at all these different factors and dis make these kind of decisions, if you say you've got to go to location B and you need some sort of additional buffering around the, the site, we will take that back to the, the district and try to negotiate that change in the lease. The 75-75 or 100-100 is normally standard for these types of leases. That was kind of identified when the town did this ordinance way back when, but it doesn't mean that you can't go beyond that. We would do the best that we could, um, but that will have a significant impact on the property owner and their ability to expand if there's a lot of cutting restrictions on the site. And um, if the board concludes we've looked at all the information and we think that would really help the buffering, then I would appreciate why you would do that. Again, respectfully, we think that limiting cutting around the tower is not going to have a significant impact on the visual impacts at any of the sites that we've looked at. And offhand, do you know what the distance is from Site B to the um, Black Point Road? 780 feet. 780 feet. Roughly. Roughly. <laughs> Maybe 782. And, uh, and from the marsh. Oh, um, let me see if I can pull up the... Uh, I think from A it was 896, but... Yeah, how about high water? High water. Let's this plan says 843. So I've got 896 uh, on that plan from the current tower location to the high water mark. Is that A? I'm sorry? Is that site A? So site yes. B. So, so there would be nine, uh, that, that's 896. Site B would be, well, let's see, where's the water line go? I think Jamil has it up. Yeah, I think it says 843. 843. So, so site B is closer to the marsh, slightly closer to the marsh, but set in more woods. Essentially, more that's, the, that's woods. the difference. And that's because you can see that the water line up where it says Nonsuch River actually moves towards the site. And so that's why the location B would be a tiny bit closer. But, the, but they're both almost nine feet away, 900 feet away from the high water mark. So, and they're both on the other side of the wastewater treatment plant. So they're quite a distance. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Chad. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, Chad's pretty Yeah. What about me? Feeling away from you've, you. You've put, your, you've put your time in. Uh, right. <laughs> Let's give you guys a break. Um, so, quick question. If we um, did ask for a brown stick, and uh, I assume there's no issues with painting, not only to match tree color and, you know, below skyline, but also above skyline, some sort of sky color. Yeah, no problems with that. Um, if we did paint other yeah. than gray, and normally we would do flat gray, and the Sims were an attempt to show kind of a neutral color. We think that the, the kind of out of the box galvanized flat gray is the best color because trees change, the leaf structure changes, the color of the sky changes, and um, it's low reflective and tends to blend in the best with the kind of mixed type of sky conditions we get. If the board wanted to do kind of bluish at the top and greenish, brownish at the bottom, we can do that too. We would just ask that you, that you folks pick the colors because we don't want to do it and then have you go, oh my God, that's horrible. The only thing to keep in mind when you have to paint it a couple of different colors is if you pick the spot where you looked at the tree canopy and you said, okay, above it it's blue and below it's brown, that dividing line only works that distance from the tower. If you step back, the dividing line shifts and all of a sudden you get kind of brown bark starts to come up into the sky or you get blue sky that starts to go down into the woods. And so it's very, very difficult to paint it from any significant number of viewpoints to kind of nail it right there at the top of the tree canopy. Um, but again, we will, we will do polka dots, we will do chartreuse, we will, we will do any color that the town uh, asks 
we just find that usually the boring flat gray works the best with the kind of bluish, cloudyish skies that we get in Maine, as lovely as our weather is. All right, and then the other question I have is, if you went to a brown stick, there's not a need for a light. No. Okay. No, we'd have to be over 190 feet before we need a night. Okay. And I just didn't know if um, the paint where it becomes maybe harder to see would yeah, no. be indicative of something that would need that. Okay. No. Yeah, we're good. We're good with no lighting okay. uh, regardless of the design. Um, I do want to address um, quickly, and feel free to stop me if you think I'm, I'm stepping out of uh, a turn here, but I want to address some of the um, public comments. And we had questions about... Um, you know, requiring some of the simulations uh, from Verizon regarding uh, whether or not this was the height you needed to make your coverage work. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we saw all of those simulations uh, in the very early iterations as to why you needed it to be 100 feet to get the coverage area you needed and support the customers that you were looking for. Yeah. Okay. So that has been provided to this board in an earlier step. Um, Let's see, you got paint color. Um, you know, there was a question regarding uh, photo simulations, whether or not, um, you know, Verizon has provided enough of those to us from a, a, a variety of locations other than roadways. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a tricky one. Um, you can, you could spend months taking photos from every which way <coughs> here in Scarborough. For me personally, I believe that you've done a relatively good job covering a lot of the angles of this tower. I'm personally satisfied, I don't know if my board members agree with me, personally satisfied with the number of locations you've chosen to take your photos, the simulations that you've done. So I just wanted to at least address that question. Um, and then uh, I'll say for what it's worth, I think I think you kind of heard it pretty loud and clear here tonight, what, what it is that I think could work. Um, in this town, you know, looking at site B, looking at that brown stick, looking at painting it. Um, it seems to me like, you know, there's been uh, a little, it's been an up and down process and you guys know it and I know it and everyone here knows it and everyone in the audience knows it. So to get to a point where um, we don't all have to walk away smiling, but we can all at least look each other in the eye and say, you know, we did, we did the best we could. and. I think we're getting close to that point, so strongly encourage you as the applicants in your next submission to put that best foot forward after hearing everything you've heard from not just this meeting, but from all those other meetings, because I do want to see us get to that point where you guys have an answer. Um, it's been oh, is that going on a year almost? It's, yeah, right. It one year. Yeah. So going on a year. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and I don't want anyone here to think for a second that we're not sensitive to that, too. We know mm -hmm. that there's... Um, whether it's you guys or any other applicant, it's a long time to be put through a process like this. Um, not that it doesn't deserve our care and attention, but you know, I think it's come to a point where you know this does need to move in a direction. You know, I don't think we can keep this in abeyance forever. So um, that's what I have to say for now. Jen, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, I will first start by saying that while this is the first meeting I've sat on for this issue. Um, we were provided with a lot of the prior, uh, all of the prior information and a lot of the public comments that have been um, submitted previously, although, you know, obviously we're not hearing the same passion and, uh, you know, emphasis from the public. I can, I can appreciate that. I, it, it's obviously a, an issue that's, um, you know, of great interest to a lot of people. So I just wanted to say that. Um, and then I only, I just have two uh, questions that are sort of matter of fact, but I'm curious what the dimension, if you know the dimension of the, um, what the brown stick would look like. Obviously, we're talking about a height of 100 feet, but the diameter of that maybe at the top or the bottom. Yeah, what, is, what do you think the diameter is at the top at 120? The top of 120? Yeah. Sorry, like 120. 80, 30 inches, I think. I think in so you won't have the mic, so third, yeah, can you, you yeah, yeah, come on up, Chip. You can talk more to the spec. Hi, folks. Chip Fredette here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Um, my, my best guess right now would be about 32 inches. Um, I think in the simulations prepared by um, Proud Snack Association, their artist rendition was showed 36 inches on top of 
the brown stick. And that was a 130 or a 150, so. 120. Okay, 120. So three feet, and I'm saying it's probably gonna be a little bit less than that, uh, but again, hard to say until an engineer has, we've done a soils analysis, sure. wind analysis, and then, and then uh, did town and foundation designs, so. Thanks, Joe. Rick? Uh, yeah, can you just uh, touch on uh, what you think would be the timetable if by going back to the sanitary district saying, all right, we've got to do it on site B, what do you think will be the, the, uh, the time frame for that? Oh, they, they, they have trustees, so they have to meet publicly. I mean, hopefully it would be a couple of months um, to try to talk to David about it, get him ready, get his trustees ready and do it. So. Um, I think that's a, a, as good a rough estimate as, as, as possible. Um, it would, um, and, and I'm trying to think, Mr. Chair, about, um, you know, David said, okay, if the planning board says that's what you need to do, we will talk to you about that. So certainly tonight, if there is that consensus, and I certainly heard the consensus out here, but if you folks are like plan B, 120 foot stick, um, something that felt like a straw poll or something might help us indicate to David that this is in fact where the board is going because I think where David was and Jay maybe you have a sense I don't know if he talked to you and Tom about this but he was essentially waiting for the planning board to make a decision and you met, might have a better sense of what that decision should look like so I can take it to Dave and say hey Dave they're serious talk to us about the lease amendment yeah so I think so I can't speak to what Dave and when we say Dave, Dave Hughes, the, um, uh, the um, executive director of the sanitary district, um, can't speak to what the sanitary district board will do, but as I mentioned, I think this board, you have your charge to be sure that the tower meets the buffering standards, all the standards of the, of the ordinance, not just the buffering standards, but if you find that alternative B, location B, best meets those standards, you have the authority to make that approval regardless of, and I think I said this earlier, regardless of what the board, uh, 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 the sanitary district board might decide down the road because that would be a private matter. But what I have had a discussion with Dave Hughes about is that that, that the board is open to, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's likely that they would find a favorable consideration if this board, you know, says that B is the only one that's going to work. Um, that the sanitary district board is likely to amend that lease again. You know, boards will do what they might may, and I can't certainly can't speak for them, but um, that it has been the indication that they're waiting for this board to make the determination, and then they will adjust their lease or not uh, accordingly. <laughs> and for, for what it's worth, I think you um, that next submission that comes to us, it should be your best foot forward. Okay. So you might go to them, and you might tell me they won't do site B. So your best foot forward should be site A with a brown stick from what I've heard. So um, I hope that's what I see. But again, this is your submission. What we're trying to encourage you to do here is that next submission. Let's get it to a point where the public gets a full chance to read whatever motion might mm -hmm. come out of this with you know the best location information, the style. That's what we're after. So I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry no, to that, cut you that, off. That, that kind of helped. And, and Jay, I appreciate your your because um, I don't want to say well site B is going to be it if there's no chance in the world that we're going to be able to get it on site B because the sanitary district is a no-go um, and is this tower constructed or the monopole constructed in a way that you won't ever need a lightning rod if it goes another 20 feet up or anything I think it has a lightning rod on it now it doesn't show it uh, it shows it on the um, the tree on the one. tree version, that, that yeah. may just be a drafting error. So there, there, there should be a lightning rod on both designs, um, and um, if it if it was taller, it would have a similar, you know, grounding structure on it okay. as well. Okay. All right. So there'd be a rod. Any other questions, Rick? I'm good. Thank yeah. you. And the original Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I have a couple questions. So I think it's pretty clear from what I heard from the public comment and um, the rest of the board members that you know what you need to focus on is the stealth pole position B okay so I mean that's I'm just repeating what everybody else said um, as far as the paint color as Nick pointed out 
it makes the most sense, and I think it was a suggestion from someone to actually have it painted two colors rather than one. And I understand the whole perspective mm -hmm. thing, but you know, you can kind of, you know what the canopy is, I'm sure your engineers come up with the best guess as to where to break the paint, or maybe you can blend it in. So, um, as far as paint color, I'm sure you've done this before, so you don't, but I'm, I know the utility uses a color called sky gray, because it blends in with the sky. I think it's ANSI 6056 or something like that. But, um, I think it's ANSI 56. That's a pretty good recall, like right off the top um, of your head there. So, and then I don't know, if, as far as below the tree line, what color would be best? Again, I mean, maybe, I don't know if you can, whatever hides it the best. Um, you know, if you can, I don't know if it makes sense to look at camouflage, but um, whatever color you can make it, I don't know, camouflage might be a little much, but whatever color blends the best with what's there. And then the other thing that Rachel kind of started to talk about and some folks in the audience, members of the public talked about a little bit about, you know, we've talked about where you can see this from public roadways and you did a good job with the pictures and uh, it was all good, but I'm not exactly sure what it looks like from, you know, all the abutters perspectives. Um, as far as cutting restrictions, I don't know if that makes sense because you need to cut what you need to cut to get that structure in there but um, I don't think I don't think that the um, sanitary district or I don't understand I guess why you couldn't plant trees I mean we make everybody else that comes here to put up a building plant trees um, so I don't know why you couldn't plant trees all around the base of it in a, in a manner to, to you know, something that goes up 25 feet, or it's not going to interfere with the antennas, but hide some of that pole. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, I'll, I'll and I can feel Chip breathing. So I know he wants to say something yeah, too. Yeah, I but, saw him get up. Um, so. He's all my breath action guy. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, I had to go last. I mean, he was killing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, normally I appreciate when you do a kind of development in which you do a lot of site work and then you build it back and then you kind of have to bring Mother Nature back around and do some buffering. What we will do and what we have the rights to do is the minimum clearing necessary to get the access drive in. And then we have a 50 by 50 foot, essentially a 75 by 70 foot, 75 foot easement area that will clear out. And we don't touch any of the vegetation that is around the site um, other than that. So by the time this is constructed, given that it's, this kind of shows the site, given the, the distance 700 and something feet from the road, there's you know a small forest there. And so you won't be able to see the base of the tower from anywhere. Um, from any of the abutters? From any of the abutting that. properties, from the marsh, from the road. I mean, it's, okay. there's so much vegetation in that area, especially you can see if you move to option B. Um, um, but, and then again, of course, a lot of the vegetation around the perimeter and even offsite is what's blocking it. So okay. um, putting additional plantings like right around the fence compound um, is kind of duplicating what's there and probably wouldn't provide any additional buffering. Okay, so it wouldn't provide any buffering for any of the abutters. Yeah. Now, we, we have sites, you know, where we do it next to a fire station or a church, and we put in the arborvitaes, you know, two rows, three feet apart, the whole nine yards, but this one is, is somewhat isolated, so okay. the existing vegetation, I think, does it. Okay. Um, I think that was, oh, you know what? I saw somewhere in the submittal um, something about the, uh, the generator. Oh, I have two things more. Hmm. I guess before we leave the whole poll, uh, when when you come, I know you did the monopole and 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 the uh, monopine, and you had conversations or whatever with AT and T um, and Sprint. Sprint. Mm -hmm. And they said that they could go at ninety and eighty, and you could be at hundred, and that's all fine, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you have to do the cell pole, which sounds like the best solution for the, everyone involved, um, are Sprint and 
uh, AT and T or whoever, I, did they have enough room in a 120 foot pole to two, put two more sections of antennas? We don't know, and um, you know, Sprint. Okay. Well, AT and T well, was <laughs> lower on the pole yeah. at 80 feet. So theoretically, if we're in the top 20. Um, if you go the next 20, theoretically that might work for AT&T. Um, well, we don't, know, but we're not entirely sure, nor do we really know what at and schedule right. is. Or, so now putting a third carrier would be, starts to get much more difficult because um, you need, you'll have um, the, the, the wire and the cabling that will go up the, it all runs up the inside of the pole to reach the antennas at the top. When you start putting more people in, you start to run out of room pretty quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think as Ivan has noted, and I, I mean, Ivan does this work for tons of towns. He worked for the, the town of Scarborough when you did the ordinance. Um, you know, this is the trade-off with the sticks. They're, they're lower volume, but co-location is, is, you know, they're not as good for co-location. But, you know, you could go 20 years without anybody coming down looking for another one, or it could be two months. We just don't know. Yeah. I would, I would think that it'd be more likely that you're going to have someone come and they're going to, you know, you're, you're going to, um, you're going to be There will be no at crying at this hearing. Probably. You're going to be at 120 feet and you're going to have more likely someone's going to want to come and go above you because they can't. That's what we don't know. And I mean, I so, think AT&T could go underneath us and two carriers could probably fit in the pole, but it's Why it's would they tight. want to though? Why would AT&T want to go lower than you if they can go behind? They have, they have a law that says they can go higher. I mean, uh, same with the, the monopole. I mean, what we do when we co-locate is we try to go on what's there. Um, you know, if you if you were to rebuild this and add 20 feet, you probably can't just come in and drop a 20-foot cap on top. So AT&T would have to come and reconstruct it, and so it would be more expensive to do it that way. If they could go on the existing structure, normally carriers will try to do that uh, just because it's less expensive. So you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't build the base of it and the diameter of it with the intent that someone would add above it? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, probably not, and probably the pole sections wouldn't, because although, I mean, because what would happen is, let's say we did a stick, and um, we somebody had asked about the size at the top, so it's 32 inches when that is the top of the stick. If you were going to add another section on a brown stick to, in order to put additional antennas in, it continues to narrow, and so if 32 inches is at the top at 120 for us, it'll get too little for somebody else. So you'd have to reconstruct the pole right. so that so when you hit us, it was 38 <laughs> inches and it would be 32 when you got to 140. Right. So, so that's kind of where I was going yeah, with this. Does it make, that, are you going to, rather than have this all reconstruct, you know, have to go reconstruct this whole so you don't thing, wanna, do they, do they, would it, and yeah, this is make just something fatter. to think about. Does it make sense to make it either make it because you can go 10% or 20 feet, whichever was greater, I think. Is that what we said? So 20% of 120, I think Rachel did the math right the first time. That's 144 feet. So does it make And I'm not a proponent of a higher tower, and I'm sure no one else in mm -hmm. this room is. But I don't think anybody else wants this thing re reconstructed in two years either, so... Yeah, so what would what? happen is that AT&T would come in, well, I, the first thing is, I don't think you want us to build the tower big enough to be ready for that last cap, because if AT&T or Sprint never come down the pike and never want this, okay. then we will have built something that is visually more intrusive Worse. for no reason. So, okay. now when AT&T comes to town, if they can go underneath us on the existing structure, they're gonna do it because it's faster and cheaper. Yeah. If they have to go up, that's kind of up to AT&T. Right. They have to put us on what's called the temporary cow, which is yeah. they've got to hang our antennas for the interim. It's really a pain. Okay. Um, so, um, but you know, if AT&T wants to do it, they would bear that expense. So, and you don't want the tower to be any bigger than it has to be until it really has right. to be bigger. And so usually it's better to go with, as a couple of people said tonight, make sure it's as small as it yeah. needs to be. So that's, yeah, that's that, that would be the 120 feet, right. 32 inches on top, and so then when you kind you of build wait the, to see. When you build the, when you build the tower, build the diameter small enough so that it's more difficult for anybody else to go above you. 
Yeah, and you don't do it. To, you, what you do is you just try to build the tower that's the right size for the installation. Right. You don't want to build it bigger because nobody wants it right. to be thicker or, right. you know, taller than it needs to be. Um, now, for the town's perspective, if AT and T comes in, you would want them to use this as opposed to going to an abutting property or doing a second tower. So there's still some benefit to co-location in the existing one. And I, I appreciate you're trying to kind of figure out what it looks like in the future. This is really hard because we don't know what any of the other carriers are actually Well, I was, what do. I was trying to figure out is if, if, there's, if there's a way, no, knowing that we don't want it any taller and bigger than it has to be, is there a way for Verizon to build it for their use, but to make it a little bit less attractive for someone else to come in and make it bigger. So just <laughs> think question. about that. You okay, know, we I'll think about that. The, you know, you've got a bunch of engineers. You don't have to do the details now. But, you know, if you have a choice to make it 36 inches at the base, which would facilitate it going up quicker, yeah, yeah. Then, then don't. But you can make it 32 and squeeze your cables in the inside of it, but not leave enough room for anybody else's cables yeah. to go above you. So that's... Um, we'll point we'll take a look. We'll definitely take a look. I think what somebody at Verizon will tell me is that um, under the terms of our FCC license, and I think actually under your ordinance, we have to kind of design these things in a way to make them available for co-location. So doing a design tweak that would make it difficult to co-locate might get us in trouble with the FCC. I, I would well, probably you, get they us They can co-locate. They, they just have to go below you. Below. That's all. Yeah. Right. That, that's going to be the important part, that you demonstrate the co-location at least at those levels below that you've yeah. already been talking about yeah, yeah. in this process. All right, they can co-locate below you. Yeah, and then uh, we'll, so we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that and let you know. All right, I, I'm not the, an engineer. The, the last thing I had was um, I don't want to keep everybody here too late. The last thing I had was on the generators. So is that 20 kilowatt generator for just your equipment and, and no co-location? And is there enough room in that box, or do they put in another box and stuff when they come? Or, Normally, each carrier would have a separate generator. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so that would be just for our site. Okay. And then um, I'm sure you've done this a million times, but um, in this particular application, we obviously want that generator to be quiet. as quiet, if yeah. not quieter than any of the... I mean, you're next to the treatment plant, so, I mean, you could obviously do a DB rating on, reading on the treatment plant and then just make it quieter than that, but... Nobody wants to hear this, Jeff. Yeah, so. and, and it'll be in a sound enclosure. It runs about 62 dBA at uh, 30 or 35 feet. So at the closest <laughs> of several hundred feet, it will be down below uh, um, the library when you hit a property line because of how deeply this is in the site. So we right. can provide the data and just show you that we'll be like well below 38, 35 dBA. Um, even if it's running at full bore, which it won't because uh, one of those cabinets... It only runs with power outage. Yeah, right? and only after six hours. So there's a battery on site that runs the project for six hours. So at that point in time, everybody's generator is on after six hours, I think. so. And it'll be super quiet at the property. I will give you those specs. Okay. I think that's all I had. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to... I'm, my takeaway is that the board is uh, very interested, if not strongly interested, if not determined, that the 120-foot stick in Plan B is the place uh, that you would like to see us go. And we're going to take that message uh, to David and his trustees and um, attempt to uh, bring some conforming plans to you at your next meeting. Yeah. Thank you, um, and I, I want to say thank you for uh, working through this process. Everyone here in the public, I really appreciate it. This type of input does really help us. I think we're getting there, so appreciate everyone. Right, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is a staff report. Uh, sure. Just I just have uh, two quick updates for the board. One, just let you know that the Acura contract zone is still underway, uh, under process with the council. They actually are going for second reading at council to Wednesday night, sorry. Um, so presuming that occurs, uh, you'll see them once they have their DOT and DEP permits, which are probably still a couple months out, but just sort of let you know that's progressing. Thank you. And I have one extra, uh, as you guys I've heard from me, we are planning a planning board workshop on April 22nd at 6 p.m. 
I think we'll have dinner. Jay says we'll have dinner. Uh, probably pizza. Um, so I've heard from most folks. Um, if you could get back to me, I believe both Ricks and Robin have not gotten back to me. So just let me know uh, if that works for you guys. I can make it. You can? Okay. I thought I'd respond. If not, I will go back to my emails. And Maybe you did. But pull it out. I think I did. Okay. I did not respond. Just for the right. <laughs> I know. So it was original. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just uh, yeah. Just let me know. Um, that's going to be sort of a behind the scenes about the development review process. So it should be a good, good program. Thanks. Administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. Correspondence. Yes, is the answer to that. We have some. Um, planning board comments. And I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Third. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you did a good job, by the way. I was going to say, make another comment.